We are live on Facebook Live, we are live on YouTube as well, and on the page of the debate. All right. We can, we can just say tasteful things while we sound check. Great. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that taste, tasteful remark, Celeste. You're welcome. Hi, Celeste. Hi, Hi Gary. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi, Louis. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you guys. So I'm promoting nice. Robert Ness, Ryan Callow. Ryan, you're the only person I don't know. Oh. Barbara Zversky. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi everybody. <laughs> you're my new friend. I've known everybody else. Uh, Rich, I think maybe we met at UMass many, many years ago. You're muted, Rich. Did you get a sound check from you? Hey, Barbara. Okay, I'm on. Oh, we've got feedback between you, you and watch. Yeah, one of you should mute, I guess. Well, I could mute everybody and unmute no, Chris, I'm really. Uh, I'm guessing that Barbara and another of our panelists are in the same place. Yeah, you're right. And we should probably only use one computer, right? You can use two yes, computers, yes. but just mute the sound on one of them. Okay. Cause there's so there's an no echo. echo. Okay. Do you want to come sit here? What? You, you, you can. Howdy, everybody. And Gary, this is my sound check. Can you hey, hear me well? Hi, Rich. Welcome. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Jude. Hi, Hood. Yeah, Hi, Jude. Yeah. Hi. Rich, it's your job to keep me honest. This is Robert. That's impossible. You you, you're, 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 I don't know about that. You're, you're holding down the opposite pole with everybody else somewhere in between, I think. So it's suitable that you, you have pole like uh, weather in your background. Yes. I'm sure it's much more multidimensional. It's true. Fair enough. See, already, you're on the job. That was a test you passed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Yejin at the University hey. of Washington, AI2. Hi. Adam, I don't think we've heard from you yet. They think. Hi, Gary. Can you hear me? Adam, I hope you'll eventually have video. And Doris, I don't think we did a sound check from you yet. Hi, Gary. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Fei Fei, I don't think you. I actually did it with Vince. Hi, Gary. Ah, OK, great. So I think we're all good to go. Ro Robert, uh, we haven't heard from you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you fine. Oh, you've great. got the fanciest audio equipment. Hey, Gary, I think we haven't. I don't think I've been checked either. Oh, can I can. Hello. And do you go by Meg or Margaret? I see Meg there. Yes, sorry. I publish, Margaret is my professional name. <laughs> All right, well, I will treat you that way. Until I should have written know. Margaret, I'm sorry. You can change it now. Change it. There's a way to like, I don't know, click on it or something yeah. and make it Margaret for the yeah. larger world. Yes. So we are live uh, on Facebook, we are live on YouTube, we are live on the web page of the event as well. Robert, we haven't heard from you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good to go. Robert, we haven't heard from you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> are we going to do a little uh, electronic music loop? <laughs> All right. Well, here we are assembled with six minutes to spare. Yeah. Yeah. What more could we want? Gary, t uh, can you put this in context of these previous uh, debates? That's what I'm going to do with my opening remarks. We still don't hear you very well, Christoph. Yeah. Uh, am I the only one in summer here? Yeah, there's a there's another dimension of variation between you and Rich. Wow, <laughs> I see. I was 
Yeah, I was checking reach over there. So I'm the only one in the summer here. So the deep south. So I'm in Vancouver and it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit where I am, but I can see snow, snow uh, on the top of the mountains from my window. I can see it here out of the window. Oh yeah, Francesca, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, heavy winter over there. <laughs> How's this, Kelly? Your sound is not great, Christoph. I don't know what oh. you're doing there. I'm sorry. Well, I'm on a small island here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think it's more like a microphone problem than an internet problem because your video is solid. Hey, Jude, Jude, the um, other day I was your, talking to. There's preferences yeah. and there's audio preferences. You might be able to change the mic level there, Christoph. Yeah. Jude, yeah. Jude, you are in LA, Jude? I just, sorry, can't hear you. <laughs> oh, yeah, Judea, we didn't get a sound check from you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, here's my sound. And oh. here's my check. Can you hear me? We hear yeah. you fine. Yes. Yes. Okay, so, okay. the only person we not quite solved the audio with. How's this now? Oh, much better. All right. Oh, okay, much good. Better. All right. Oh, now you don't sound as far away as Rich looks. <laughs> And this is going to go on, Gary, till uh, uh, for three hours, right? Three hours. Yes. And yes. We will get you out of here on time. We thank you for for your donation of your time and labor and good humor. So I wish I could take you all out for a drink afterwards. How about giving us a vaccine shot instead? <laughs> I wish I could do that too. Is Canada also rolling them out this week? Or yeah, the public health week? officer gave herself one ahead of everybody else. I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm not high on the list of priorities as far as they're concerned, and probably should. Be. I just stay inside my house and don't really need it as badly. Well, well, while well, we have a, a minute or two here, let me just be the first to to thank Gary for bringing together this group. This is an awesome okay. group. It's an honor to be a part of it. You're uh, here. Many of you are my heroes. Thank you. My heroes are here too. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Vince. Thank you all for being there. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Round of applause to you, Gary. Thank you very much. So our mission is to open people's minds and educate them. We won't convince anybody of anything, but if we get them to think about new things, and that'll be great. I don't know if I'll have time to say it, but I'll, I'm thinking of the MIT expression about it, um, drinking uh, water from a fire hose. We're gonna send a fire hose of good ideas out there and hopefully some land. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Looking for convergence here. Yeah, that's great. Convergence, as Lewis knows, is the magic word on my opening that. Opening <laughs> oh, I see. Well, yeah. Gave it I have so many. Secret. Everybody drinks. There are so many. Convergence. Yeah. So many heroes here. Jude, Jude, the last time I saw Dov, he sent you his regards. Dov Gabay. So we start in uh, one minute. Great. So I will bring you uh, bring uh, spotlight my presentation for now. So you all see uh, my presentation. You all see uh, the sixteen speakers. Bring you uh, bring uh, spotlight my presentation for now. Vincent, can you tell how many people are logged on? Um, 
I don't see it, but I will take a look. We had about 3,500 pre-registered and then lots more will be streaming. So it's pretty good. Yes. yes, yes. So uh, let me see that. Uh, on Facebook, we have 348 right now live, but uh, it, will, it will go up. It will go up. L last year, we had uh, at the end of the event, at the end of the night, we had 30,000 views. So um, we, we have views from YouTube as well and uh, Facebook Live and on the page of the event. And, it, and it's one o'clock. Let's get started. Let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to AI Debate 2. I am Vincent Boucher, president of Montreal AI. Last year, we presented the AI debate, Yoshio Bengio versus Gary Marcus on the best way forward for AI. Today, we're presenting with Gary Marcus, AI debate two, moving AI forward, an interdisciplinary approach. Our participants are Ryan Callow, Eugene Schwa, Daniel Kahneman, Celeste Kidd, Christophe Koch, Louis Lamb, Fifi Lee, Adam Marblestone, Margaret Mitchell, Robert Ness, Judy Appel, Francesca Rossi, Ken Stanley, Rich Sutton, Doris Tsao, and Barbara Tversky. The AI Debate 2 moderator is Gary Marcus. Our plan for the AI Debate 2, a general opening statement. With Ga by Gary Marcus, followed by Panel 1, Architecture and Challengers, with Yejen Chua, Louis Lamb, Fifi Lee, Robert Ness, Judy Appel, Ken Stanley, and Rich Sutton. Panel 2, Insights from Neuroscience and Psychology, with Danny Kahneman, Christoph Karsh, Adam Marblestone, Doris Tsao, and Barbara Tversky. And Panel 3, Toward AI We Can Trust with Ryan Callow, Celeste Kidd, Margaret Mitchell, and Francesca Rossi. Then, our guests will take questions from the audience, followed by a general closing statement by Gary Marcus. Finally, I will present the AI Debate 2 closing remark. The hashtag for the event is AI Debate 2. I did lose, did I lose it? Shall I take it away? No, no, not, not yet. I have to, um, I just did lose something. That, that's perfect. It should be fine. Uh, I, I just did something. That's, that's fine. So international audience questions can be submitted via the web form on this web page. Montreal AI is grateful to our speakers and to our moderator and co-organizer Gary Marcus. Let's listen to his general opening statement. Gary? All right. I'm going to share screen and hopefully this will uh, give, work. Give, give me some time. I have to put you as the, as the main. So um, I, I see you fine. I see you fine. Okay. Tell me when I can go. Oops. So uh, we see you everywhere. So uh, that should be fine. All right. Uh, off stage, so to speak, Christoph Koch said, are you going to situate this in the context of the last debate? And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So last year at the first annual December AI debate, and we've started to make this a tradition, Yashua Bengio and I discussed what I think is one of the key debates of the last decade, which is our big data and deep learning alone enough to get to artificial general intelligence. We had some debate about deep learning as we know it today versus the future. That debate has been going on at least since 2012 when deep learning became popular. Um, there was great work by Jeff Hinton and his students putting deep learning on GPUs and getting record-breaking results um, on recognizing images. The New York Times put that on the front page uh, in November 2012. And just a couple of days later, I wrote a critical article about deep learning in the New Yorker. And I said that deep learning uh, was par only part of a larger challenge of building intelligent machines, that it lacked ways of 
representing causal relationships, faced challenges in representing abstract ideas, had no obvious ways of performing logical inferences and was a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. And I borrowed an old kind of proverb and I said that deep learning was a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. And then for the next eight years, there's been a lot of back and forth about that. I finally wrote down a more technical paper about this in 2018 called Deep Learning, a Critical Appraisal. I argued that deep learning was data hungry, that it was shallow, it had limited capacity for transfer. There was no natural way to deal with hierarchical structure, that it struggled with open-ended inference, wasn't sufficiently transparent. You can read uh, the rest later. I won't go through all of them. Um, and I pointed to work by Judea and Lewis Lamb and other people. Um, I emphasized that a way forward might be hybrid models and that we should rely more on cognitive and developmental psychology. I think you'll see the roots in all of that in how we put together today's panels to try to address all, all of these kinds of questions. Some people really like the paper. Um, my friend, the economist, Eric Gringlefson tweeted about it. He said there were thoughtful insights from Gary Marcus on why deep learning won't get us all the way to artificial intelligence. And notoriously, Jan LeCun felt very differently. He said thoughtful perhaps, but mostly wrong nevertheless. And there was a big Twitter storm about all of that, which you can go back in history and read about. Um, and I've continued to get, shall we say, some uh, interesting press. Um, here's a report from last year after the debate with Bengio. I'll let you read that. Um, and early in 2020, I'm kind of zoom into this year, I wrote a piece that we, I put on the reserve list of readings um, called The Next Decade in AI, Four Steps Towards Robust AI, where I proposed a hybrid knowledge-driven reason-based approach centered around cognitive models. And then earlier, uh, well, after that, but early in 2020, GPT-3 became the new focal point um, for this debate. I imagine you've all seen it. It won the 2020 NeurIPS Best Paper Award, and I think it's the only AI that has ever written an op-ed for The Guardian. Um, it had a thousand times the input data that its predecessors had. It's undeniably better than its predecessor, GPT-2, but there's still problems. So um, as you might expect from me, I wrote with Ernie Davis a kind of critique of it and had examples where the statistical predictions that it made didn't really make sense. So the input to the system for in one instance was you poured yourself a glass of cranberry juice, but then you absentmindedly poured about a teaspoon of grape juice into it. It looks okay, you try sniffing it, but you had a bad cold, so you can't smell anything. You're very thirsty, so, and then very sensibly it continues, so you drink it, a kind of autocomplete that we might all appreciate. And then it says you're now dead, which is obviously a complete misunderstanding of human biology. Not everybody bought my arguments. Just a few weeks later, uh, Jeff Hinton pronounced that deep learning is going to be able to do everything. And it felt like it's just eight years ago all over again, that we really haven't made any progress. And then suddenly, in the final months of this crazy year, something that was not on my bingo card for 2020, but what was, um, we finally saw some convergence. So here's Jan LeCun in October talking about GPT-3, um, giving lines that I might well have written. Some people have completely unrealistic expectations about what large scale language models such as GPT-3 can do. It doesn't have any knowledge of how the world actually works. Its knowledge is very shallow. And trying to build intelligent machines by scaling up language models is like building a high altitude airplane to go to the moon. And Jan even included an example that you might have found uh, in one of my books. His friends tried GPT-3 as a suicide prevention uh, system. And it said, hey, I feel very bad. A person said, hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. And the system uses statistics to come up with, come up with. I'm sorry to hear that. I can help you with that, which is sensible. And then the system is, or sorry, person says, should I kill myself? And the system says, I think you should, obviously showing no understanding of human psychology or what a suicide prevention system should be. Um, an example that I too love. And then Yashua gave a talk in dis December um, saying, what is missing towards human level AI? And I think this is exactly what we all should be working on. It's trying to understand how we can get AI systems that understand the variables they manipulate, including language perception and action. We should try to understand what understanding itself means. Um, we want systems that can capture causality, capture how the world works, understand abstract actions, reason and plan, explain what happened and generalize out of distribution. This is just stunning convergence, I believe. And uh, one more example, Jürgen Schmidhuber and uh, some collaborators just had a paper uh, earlier this month um, arguing for a compositional approach to AI in terms of symbol-like 
representations. And he said that they said that was fundamental um, in realizing human level generalization. So, you know, we spent the last eight years arguing about whether we need these things. And I think we now all agree or almost all agree, which means it's time to launch the debate of the next decade, which is how can we take AI to the next level? And um, as Vince told you, we're gonna have uh, a different kind of debate here uh, this year with 16 people. And the point is to represent a huge diversity of views um, from many different fields um, divided into these three panels, architecture and challenges, insights from neuroscience and psychology, and towards AI we can trust. Um, I'm gonna stop my video because Fei-Fei Lee is gonna be our next presenter and she's gonna set up. We're gonna try to use our time as wisely as we can, but I'll keep talking while she sets up. Um, and I will just introduce Fei-Fei, who's gonna be the first of our 16 speakers. So we'll have, um, we'll break them into three sets. Each speaker gets three minutes. Um, we will give them a little timer and a, a little bit of a hard time after the fact if they go over. So Fei-Fei, if you don't know, is a professor of computer science at Stanford. Sherry, Sherry, sorry to interrupt. Can you stop sharing? Otherwise I won't be able to share. Oh, I tried to. You are, oh, okay. how's that? Is that better? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Fortunately, you won't have any more slides for me. Um, so quickly, she's a professor of computer science at Stanford. She's co-director of the Stanford Human Centered AI Institute. Um, I've been a huge fan of hers since I first saw her give a talk in 2014. And I can't think of anyone better to be our lead off speaker today. Take it away, Fei-Fei. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gary and Vince. And uh, since you promise extreme punishment for uh, going over three minutes, I'll just cut to the chase and share with you in the next three minutes, a little bit of what uh, I've been thinking. Um, one thing I love about being a scientist is really science to me is about pushing the boundaries of human knowledge through constantly asking more questions and inventing the tools to get there. And uh, my favorite quote from my favorite uh, scientist, Einstein, is the mere formulation of a problem is often far more essential than its solution, which requires creative imagination and, and marks real advances in science. And um, in the next two minutes, I'll just um, really focus on this problem formulation, which I call seeking the North Star. One of the North Stars that uh, the world of AI really benefited from is the great, great cognitive and neuro, um, uh, neurophysiology work in the last 30 years of 20th century. And we have some of the pioneers sitting here in this panel. Um, the, the, the one critical North Star for, for uh, intelligence, human intelligence, especially visual intelligence, is the recognition that object recognition is a critical functionality of human intelligence. Uh, object detection is fast um, by human behavior as well as in the brain, and we find neural correlates for that. And this North Star guided um, an important AI problem in the first decade or so of uh, 21st century, which is the problem of object and image classification. And uh, we have um, benchmarks uh, like ImageNet uh, that created uh, part of the tooling to reach this North Star, which gave us the deep learning revolution that uh, Gary briefly spoke about and we're all familiar with. And also, um, without going over uh, repeating what Gary said, there has been a lot of limitations. So as a scientist, we ask ourselves, what is the next AI North Star? Of course, there's more than one, but I myself have been is extremely inspired by um, um, evolution and development. Here are two great books I particularly love, one by a zoologist, Andrew Parker, that says uh, the, the critical moment uh, of Big Ben of evolution, which is the animal speciation, is triggered by the sudden evolution of vision or perception, which sets off an evolutionary arms race where animals either evolved or died. And to put it even more beautifully by philosopher Peter Godfrey and um, Smith is that he connects the, the evolution uh, the animal um, functionality of perception and action 
by the evolution of our nervous system and says the original and fundamental function of the nervous system is to link perception with action. With all these conjectures, I wanna share with you a story of two kittens, one very sad kitten, a seminal work by, in the 1960s, showing that if you, give, if you allow kittens, uh, newborn kittens, to see the world, one active kitten has uh, his own uh, self-guided interaction and motion to see the world with a passive kitten yoked to the active kitten who does not have the option to be self-guided. Self After a few weeks, the, the nervous system have drastically different outcome. Basically, the pass passive kitten cannot develop a fully functional perceptual system, uh, nervous system, whereas the active kitten can. So this point to, in my opinion, one of the most exciting next North Stars of AI, which is intelligence emerges from active perception and interaction with the world. And uh, there is a fundamentally critical loop between perception and actuation that drives learning, understanding, reasoning, and planning. And this loop um, is, is, can be better realized when our AI agent is embodied, can dial between explorative and exploitative actions, is multimodal, multitask, uh, generalizable, and oftentimes social. And in my closing, um, closing uh, slide, I just want to share with you that this is the kind of work that I feel extremely excited about. And we are working on different aspect of um, building interactive learning agent that uses perception and actuation to, to learn and understand the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I needed? Not needed. Thank you very much, Fei Fei. We will come back for questions later. And Louis Lamb is going to be our next speaker. He's coming to us from Brazil, where he's a professor of computer science, but also a secretary of state for his province. I, I don't think anybody else on our panel um, is quite so uh, high up in the political order of their nation. Um, he's also, in addition to all that, a pioneer in neurosymbolic models. Um, he's a co-author of a 2009 book called Neurosymbolic Cognitive Reasoning with Arturo de Villa Garcés. Um, and also with Arturo de Villa Garcés, Neurosymbolic AI, The Third Wave. Um, these are both terrific works. He will not show all of those slides in the same uh, order, but here we go in a second. The second, yeah. Well, welcome, Lewis. Thank you, Gary. Indeed, you are an inspiration. A lot of our work. Uh, built upon your work since the 90s and work by Judy Pearl and many of our heroes here. So this is joint work with Arthur Garces in, and in honor of uh, the scientific revolution we are having now, I also have the honor to present this picture that is very well known. And um, the reading that we have for this talk is a paper called Neurosymbolic AI, the third wave that we re recently posted on uh, on archive and it uh, summarizes over 20 years of research in this field. And over the last year and at AAAI this year, uh, there, there has been a lot of convergence as Gary Marcus has said, and Francesca and Daniel who are both here today and uh, Gary have been defending the importance of building hybrid models so that one can uh, aim at, at building uh, integrated learning and reasoning systems in AI the so-called AI systems one and two that also borrow inspiration from Daniel Kahneman who is here today. And uh, this has also been a big challenge in AI and big challenge in science as Fei Fei mentioned about uh, uh, ancient results in science and in human endeavor towards knowledge. Uh, um, Les Valiant in one of his books has said that the tension between reasoning and learning has a long history reaching back at least as far as Aristotle. So we know that uh, in terms of science evolving, what we want to do here is exactly this convergence because one of the key questions is to identify the building blocks of AI and how to make uh, AI more trustworthy, AI explainable, but not only explainable, interpretable as well. 
So uh, in order to make AI interpretable sound and to use the uh, right models, right computational models, so that one can explain what's going on in AI, we'll need better representations. We need models that are sound and soundness and the results that come from logic, the correctness results, and all of that can benefit, of course, the great results we are having on deep learning. So our work corroborates this point that uh, uh, Gary Marcus made and also that uh, Danny Kahneman made at AAAI, that system one, I mean the fast system one that's associated with concepts like deep learning, certainly knows language, as Daniel Kahneman said, and system two, which is more reflective, certainly does involve certain manipulation of symbols. So this analogy of system one and two leads us to build the ideas that are the inspiration, the inspiration that uh, Gary brought in his book, the algebraic, the algebraic Mind, and also that we formalized in several neurosymbolic systems since the early 2000s, and some of them, several of them, temporal reasoning, model reasoning, reasoning about knowledge are formalized in this book. And of course, we have been evolving this concept so that we, one can deal with combinatorial explosion and several other symbolic problems within a neurosymbolic framework. And so the approach that we have been defending over the years is that we need a foundational approach for neurosymbolic computing, neurosymbolic AI that's based both on logical formalization, and we have Francesca here, Judy Pearl, that, he'd been, that have been outstanding results on symbolic AI and machine learning. And we use logic and knowledge representation to represent the reasoning process that is integrated with, with machine learning systems so that we can also effective, effectively perform neural learning using deep learning machinery. So our approach has been tested in training assessment simulators by TNO, which is a, a, a Dutch subsidiary of the government. It has been applied in robotics and AI and several other applications. But what we offer here is a sound way, including some formal results that our neurosymbolic systems, in order so that we can have more effective and more trustful AI, we need uh, to have models, interpretable models that are based on sound logical models. And in this way, we can explain what the neural learning process is doing at the same way that we can prove that the results that we obtain via machine learning can even be related to the formal results that one typically expects from symbolic logic. For instance, here in a system that we call connections, connectionist model logic, which was, by the way, published in the same issue of neurocomputation that Jeff Hinton published one of his influential paper on deep belief nets, we proved that uh, model and temporal logic programs can be computed soundly in neural network models. So in this way, what we provide in a way is a way of providing neural networks as a learning system, which can also learn to compute in a deep way the evolution of knowledge in time. And this is what we explain in several of our papers and also in recent work that we published, Gary, in, um, in uh, AAAI 2019 and now each guy 2020 where we present a survey paper. So the, 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 the final message here is that there have been some developments including uh, the AI debate, the great AI debate between Benjo and uh, Gary Marcus last year, which we saw also at AAAI 2020 that we need more convergency towards building more effective AI systems and AI systems that most people can trust since AI is becoming a lingua franca for science these days. Thank you, Gary, for my first three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, next, from the frozen north, we have Rich Sutton, who is um, both a distinguished research scientist at DeepMind and also a professor at University of Alberta, where he's uh, coming from or pretending to come from, depending on that reality of, of the background there. Um, he is uh, famous for having really kicked off reinforcement learning. I think a lot of the most famous results in the last several years are things that DeepMind did that build on some of his ideas, including all of their victories in chess and Go and various video games and so forth. 
Um, he's maybe the furthest from me in, in some dimensions in the discussion that we have today. And I am delighted uh, that he uh, was willing to join us. I look forward to his presentation. Take it away, Rich. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides. It's a real pleasure to talk to you all um, about these general issues. So I wanna bring us back, try to get some perspective uh, to one of the greatest heroes of cognitive science, which is uh, David Marr, the neuroscientist and vision researcher, David Marr, who died in 1980 at the age of 35. And in his brief, brilliant career, he did many things, but I think today what he's most known for is the, the three level hypothesis, which is um, that uh, any information processing system must be understood at three levels, sort of a computational theory level about the problem and breaking down into algorithms and hardware implementation. So um, the, the computational theory level is what I want you to really focus on. Uh, so what is the goal of the computation? That's what we look at in computational theory. Uh, what are the purposes? Why is it appropriate to, to compute certain things rather than other things? Whereas um, next level down, the middle level is uh, how would that be done? Which representations and which algorithms would be used? And uh, finally, the lower level is again, how, but how physically could it be done? So David Marr liked to emphasize the computational theory level. He thought it was the most important and at the same time, the most neglected. And I think it's still true uh, it's true in, in neuroscience that we are missing sort of a, a high level understanding of the, the goal and the purposes of the overall uh, mind. Uh, it's also true in artificial intelligence, but perhaps more surprisingly in AI, uh, but there's really very little computational theory in, in, in Mars sense in AI. So for example, in AI textbooks, they will often decline to define the problem of intelligence. They will say, it's something like getting machines to do things, whatever it is that people do. They won't really explain what it is. And the big ideas and the controversies are mostly at the middle level and they're not at the computational theory level. So we've heard, we just heard uh, Louise Lamb talk about uh, integration of neural approaches and symbolic approaches. Well, this is a controversy. It's a focus of the last debate, but it is only about, it's not about a computational theory. It's not about the problem. It's about how you achieve something as if we understood already what it is we were trying to do. Um, it's important always to understand the problem before you approach the solution. And other ideas, production rules, Bayes updating, subsumption, gradient descent, dynamic system theory, all these are hows. They're not what's. They don't characterize the overall problem. So then that brings me to my thesis that reinforcement learning is the first computational theory of intelligence. Reinforcement learning is explicit about the goal, about the what's and the why's. So according to reinforcement learning, the goal is to maximize an arbitrary reward signal. And to this end, the agent has to compute a policy, a value function, and a generative model. And each of these contributes in a clear way uh, to maximizing reward. And each is a clear what. The value function, for example, is a function from states to a prediction of the future reward. And we know how that can really improve the speed of learning and be used in, in more cognitive things in conjunction with the model, uh, with the world model as well. So it would be good to have more work at this computational theory level and reinforcement learning. It would be good to have other candidate uh, computational theories. Um, so uh, we might think of uh, other ones like, uh, 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 like uh, the compression theory of mind or homeostasis, predictive coding, uh, the Bayes, the Bayes in, uh, inference approach, all these can be made more complete and clear. I don't think they rise yet to uh, a level of a specification of the overall problem of intelligence. So as it stands now, I think uh, AI really needs an agreed upon computational theory of intelligence and maybe all of cognitive science needs an agreed upon computational theory intelligence and reinforcement learning is the standout candidate for playing this role in our science. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Um, I found very little to disagree with uh, as you uh, imagine. Um, our next speaker is Judea Pearl. 
Um, he's the winner of the Turing Award for Fundamental Contributions to AI Through the Development of a Calculus for Probabilistic and Causal Reasoning. He's the director of the UCLA Cognitive Systems Laboratory and uh, instigator of the Causal Revolution, author of three books on causality, including Causality and the best-selling uh, book, I guess he's co-author of, uh, The Book of Why, which I recommend to all. And uh, uh, for those who can absorb the technicality, I recommend all of his books. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you, Judea. Thank you, Gary. Uh, do I see my first two slides? Oh, I need to uh, push them. You need to share screen. We don't see them yet. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Can you see it now? Mm. No. Oh. It's at the, it's at the bottom of uh, your screen. So sh share screen. No, it's not there. Share screen, and then you do one more click. Okay, but I'm I'm out of it now. I'm out of the share screen. Nope. Am I sharing? No, no I'm sorry. It doesn't you see. You without it? No. Let me get out of it. Uh, no. I don't know. So do you see at the bottom of your screen in the middle, there is a kind of, uh, it's written share, share screen? No, I don't. That's my problem. Well, take, take your time. Oh, here, here it is. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Oh, here, here we are. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, it's working. Great. <clears throat> Good. So uh, it is uh, the first time it, I'm using the word domestication for causal reasoning. I used uh, previously uh, words like mathematization, algorithmization, democratization, and I thought that uh, domestication will be less provocative when we talk about the revolution. Uh, the causal revolution is something that I use to describe the, um, uh, my experience in the past three decades of trying to domesticate the problems in uh, causal reasoning. And uh, luckily, fortunately, I believe we succeeded in building an inference engine that um, on the one hand <clears throat> solves some practical and conceptual problem that only decades ago were thought to be too metaphysical or too undoable. Um, that <clears throat> recently I came to the realization that we are sitting on a gold mine and the gold mine is encapsulated in the words deep learning. So I'm proposing now the engine that was constructed in the causal um, revolution to represent a, a state of mind, a computational model of a mental state deserving of the title deep understanding. We have many deep, deep learning and deep neural nets and deep that and deep that. And now I have a deep understanding. And my definition and the reason that I take the audacity to <clears throat> um, call to justify deep learning is very simple. It's the first symbolic uh, object that I know that can perform three functions. What is, what if, and if only, retrospectively. And uh, <clears throat> based on that, I'm inviting now 
the uh, AI community to exercise, to use that engine as a testing ground for theory of explanation, of fairness, adaptation, imagination, everything we wanted, but we were too scared to program or to think about, many to experiment with. And the idea of having a symbolic object that you can manipulate, change, uh, reparameterize, reconfigure at, at will, and it performs these functions that I call uh, the three level functions is uh, and could be an enormous advantage to the community. I sometimes liken it to the invention of the Volta pile in the 17th or 18th century, 1801, I believe it was, yeah, where it provided the laboratories of Europe with a flowing current, an electrical current. Every laboratory in Europe then was able to experiment with electricity, which led, of course, to the electromagnetic theory and so forth. But having a, an object, a laboratory that can, that can be put under the microscope, manipulated, and uh, provide a testing ground for theories of fancy things like imagination and humor, it, I think it's a, a great, it has a, offer a great future. So this is the second part of it. And I, I should also apologize for using a circular region, uh, reasoning here. On the one hand, I say I define deep learning as a computational model that can perform three functions at the three levels of the causal hierarchy. And I might be accused of defining um, things um, that just happen to satisfy the three uh, level of reasoning that uh, characterize the, um, the inference engine. But considering the fact that causal reasoning is so deeply woven into day-to-day -day language, into our thinking, our sense of justice, our humor, and of course, the scientific understanding, I think it wouldn't be too presumptuous of me to propose this testing ground for, the, for other endeavors in AI, including vision and natural language understanding, to be a testing ground. And I, since I still have one minute, I stipulate, I would like to talk about the cultural impl implication. I'm very much opposed to the culture of data only. And this is not just an opinion or just um, a position. It's based on mathematical results that prove that what you can do and what you cannot do with data only, what you can do and what you cannot do with actions only, action and data, and what you need to have in order to be able to reason um, on the full three levels of the hierarchy. Uh, and I therefore propose a hybrid, um, some people call it a hybrid neural and symbolic. I don't go for, the, for this dichotomy. I think what's important is input output. Where is information coming from? and what kind of question you want to answer with information. So the higher rate I'm talking about is built on the basis of input output. Where is the information coming for? And in that area, I believe that we should <clears throat> build systems which have a combination of um, knowledge of the world, together with knowledge of, of, together with data. And knowledge of the world means really it's a two body problem. The world 
reality and data. Data being not the womb from which knowledge emerged, but an instrument or a window through which look, we look for to interrogate the reality of the world around us. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, we need to have knowledge. We have to have common sense knowledge. We have to utilize education with which we educate our children. We have to have the history on our side and most important, the innate template that enables newly born to manipulate the toy world around them. Uh, that kind of structure must be implemented externally to the data. And because even if we succeed by some miracle to learn that structure from data, we still need to have it in the form that is communicable with human beings. It's very hard to find a haystack, a needle in the haystack, but it's especially hard, almost impossible, if you haven't seen a needle before. And here the work in causal reasoning offers the community a picture of the needle. Therefore, we, we should know what we are looking for and we should know how to use it and to advantage to communicate with human users eventually. I'm gonna move us along. Thank you very much, Judea. I completely agree about the importance of, of adding knowledge and not just being data-driven. And I think we'll have interesting conversations with Rich about that in a moment. Our next speaker is uh, Robert Ness, who is also gonna talk about causality. Um, he's a machine learning engineer. He's an expert in causal inference and programmatic causal reasoning. Um, and he also writes the fabulously lucid altdeep.ai newsletter um, that I enjoy and take it away, Robert. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Dr. Pearl, would you mind stop sharing the screen? It's up here. One second. Where you click share screen, you should be able to click stop sharing. I should know. Stop sharing, here we are. Okay, so I'll also be talking about um, causal reasoning and um, I, 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 in my heart of hearts, I'm an engineer and I'm, I like to build products. And so I'm, I'm thinking about many of the things that Dr. Pro just talked about um, in terms of how we're going to actually build artifacts that we can deploy to production and, um, and, and, and apply to, to, to powerful uh, use cases. And, and that we in, in, in like a business. Uh, so, uh, my prediction is that probabilistic programming will be key to addressing AI's challenges with causality. And so, probabilistic machine learning it gives us a unified approach to reasoning and decision making under uncertainty. Probabilistic programming languages enable you to build a probabilistic machine learning models by writing programs, writing software that represent probability distributions with. Um, with gener general pro uh, purpose programming languages. And they also give us abstractions for reasoning about these models uh, using data uh, and making predictions and decisions. And modern probabilistic programming languages build on deep learning and automatic differentiation to scale probabilistic machine learning to large high dimensional data sets with nonlinear relationships between the variables there. And so, uh, one of the reasons I make this prediction is because there's, first off, there's a very natural connection between probabilistic programming and, and causal modeling. So users of probabilistic programming languages typically write models that explicitly represent the causal flow of the process that generates the data. Um, secondly, we uh, probabilistic programming languages have their roots in, in BaseNets where causal inference is a common use case. Uh, we have some eminent, you know, cognitive scientists on this panel today. Um, you know, 
computational cognitive scientists use probabilistic programming and develop probabilistic programming languages to model how humans generate causal explanations. Uh, and finally, it's, it's very closely related to computer simulation, where we, this is a field, um, particularly in engineering and natural sciences, where we directly model mechanism. And so we can also use probabilistic programming for formal causal inference. So probabilistic programming languages can implement the well-defined formal causal models, such as structural causal models. Uh, we can also, we're also developing formal methods to extend these to a broader, more expressive class of causal programs. Uh, probabilistic programming, programming gives us an intuitive way to combine causal assumptions with the kinds of inductive biases that we like to see in machine learning that we rely on in, in, in Bayesian modeling. Um, and probabilistic programming uh, gives us, it can happily adopt the deep neural network architectures as components in a larger causal structure. So finally, it gives us the ability to make learners that can reason counterfactually, right? So some of the more popular languages like Pyro, Omega, Multiverse, they enable algorithmic counterfactual reasoning. And this enables us to build agents that can reason by generating counterfactual explanations, much as humans do. So this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I, I've spent a lot of time building conversational AI. And what you want is to have a bot think of an appropriate thing to say to a user and then ask if it's or somehow get some feedback whether or not that was a good thing to say. If, if not, then it should imagine or um, to use um, uh, Dr. Pearls, I think you just said, um, um, if only, uh, if only I had said something better, uh, I would uh, what uh, I would have gotten a better outcome. And then you can kind of imagine what uh, other things it could have said, and then update its policy for how for how to interact with that user. Um, I want to point people out to this GitHub repo where you can find some video tutorials and some code tutorials. Um, and also, if you're interested in this field, uh, here are some papers to get you started. All right, thank you very much. Uh, for that, our next speaker is Ken Stanley, who's at OpenAI um, and also University of, of uh, Central Florida. Um, he is an author of a book called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, The Myth of, of um, the Objective. Um, and he was co-founder with me of a company called Geometric Intelligence, which we uh, sold to Uber. Um, it was a great pleasure working with him there, and it's a great pleasure to introduce him now. Take it away, Ken. You're muted. You're muted, Ken. Sorry. Am I here now? <laughs> You're here now. Okay. Sorry about that. Act 2020. Okay. Thank you to the organizers for, for this great event. Um, it is well established that AI can solve problems, but there's something that we humans can do that is still very unique, um, which is that we exhibit what's called open-ended innovation, which means that we layer idea upon idea upon idea over the millennia of human civilization, bringing us from modest things like fire and wheels, all the way up to space stations and computers in a single run of an incredible explosion of complexity, um, which we would call an open-ended system. And um, this is a uniquely human uh, capability, which is still far from anything that we see in modern algorithms. And it's interesting to consider that these kind of phenomena um, not only appeared in the universe after we began, um, began to produce them, but we actually are a product of an open-ended sy system as well, which is of course called natural evolution. And I recognize that this picture also, uh, Fei Fei also had this picture. Um, so maybe we're, we're converging on something here. Um, but we, um, what is really interesting about this is that you see a similar phenomenon there, which from a completely different causal chain, um, where over more than a billion years, all of living nature was invented in what is in effect a single run of something. 
Um, this is a phenomenal system and it invented such things over the run, like for example, things like um, photosynthesis or the flight of birds or intelligence at the human level. In fact, it's the only thing that has ever produced an actual system with intelligence at the human level. And then once we began to exist in the universe, um, you got all the millennia of creativity of human civilization in all the spheres of invention and science and art and music and all the other spheres of human endeavor. Uh, which follow us. And so what I want to just uh, suggest for this brief talk is that uh, we should be trying to understand these phenomena. This is really interesting that this is not only an explanation for our actual existence because it perceived us and created us, but it also seems deeply entrenched in our nature and is perhaps like the most human of what makes uh, intelligence a fundamental aspect of humanity, actually all of the things that we produced through our creative spirit. And so if we do uh, begin to pursue this topic of open-endedness and try to understand it and create algorithms that exhibit similar phenomena, then um, it begins to move to the forefront, what I would say are some more neglected dimensions of intelligence. For example, divergence, as opposed to our current obsession with convergent algorithms, populations, as opposed to putting all your eggs in a single basket, diversity preservation, stepping stone collection, though we know not where those stepping stones may lead, um, generating new solutions and new problems at the same time in the same run. And finally, I pulled this one out, the environment, because I think it gets so, so little discussion, but it's a very interesting topic, is that we don't know, it's worth pointing out, we don't actually know what is the property of our universe that has facilitated something that could go on for more than a billion years of creativity. We don't create systems like this, like none of the domains or artificial systems we create have this property. So you're just putting algorithms aside for a second, this is a, uh, a fertile area for research to understand open-ended environments where the surface is still barely scratched. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, opening our minds to open-endedness. And that leaves the last speaker for the first panel, which is Yejin Choi, who is a professor of computer science at University of Washington. She just won a AAAI 20 Outstanding Paper Award. And she's been uh, do. Uh, following her own hybrid approach, I suppose, using common sense transformers with good old fashioned uh, AI, trying to combine symbolic reasoning and neural networks, which is dear to my heart. Um, and I really look forward to seeing what she can pack into the next three minutes. Take it away. All right. So this should be fun. Um, so why common sense? Because despite human level performances on leaderboards, today's state of the art models are brittle and make such silly mistakes that humans will never make when provided with adversarial or out of domain examples. So the bottom line, we know how to solve a data set without solving the underlying task with deep learning today. And that's really due to the significant difference between AI and human intelligence, especially um, what Judia said earlier that the knowledge of the world or common sense is the one of the uh, fundamental missing pieces so common sense, uh, the common misconception about common sense, by the way, is that it may be just the, some facts that everyone knows and agrees upon. If it's that simple, we would have solved already by just enumerating all of them. The, here comes my key point though, which is through this famous example, Roger Shepard's Monsters in a Tunnel, what you see here is not just some objects in a scene. You see a story that two monsters are running as opposed to standing still on one foot. Um, their intent being one is chasing another as opposed to trying to copy their body movements and their mental states being hostile or being afraid, mm -hmm. even though actually two faces are identical. These examples are from the Enigma of a Reason, highly recommended if you haven't seen that one. Anyhow, two important takeaway uh, messages. Uh, first of all, none of these inferences is absolutely true. Everything is um, sort of causal and stochastic in nature, but defeasible with additional context. And also a great deal of such inferences can be best described in natural, natural language. Our causal reasoning is really deeply integrated mm -hmm. into language. Another point that Julia made earlier today. And so here comes the controversial remarks of the day, which is obligatory in a debate like this. So when we talk about language, um, symbolic, neurosymbolic integration, I think we need to embrace language, the entirety of it, not just to some words. 
which is the more commonly made um, assumption. And if you are not satisfied with my reasoning, uh, that's also the point made by Hofstadter and um, Sander. And yes, that's the Douglas Hofstadter that uh, you know about from another book. Um, and so if you buy that, then reasoning really becomes a generative task as opposed to categorization task that we are more familiar with in today's uh, deep learning benchmarks. And that's because the space of reasoning becomes infinite and we gotta really be able to deal with it. And the beautiful thing about human intelligence is that we can think out loud. We can oftentimes reason by just writing or speaking on the fly, word by word, without enumerating a million possible sentences that you could have said instead. We just never really enumerate very much. We just reason on the fly. And this is really going to be one of the key um, fundamental intellectual challenges that we can think about going forward. So several years ago, only several years ago, when I started contemplating on research on common sense, I was told not to even speak the word because nobody would take me seriously. But then I realized the past failures are completely inconclusive when, when they were only based on weak computing power, not much data and so forth. So path to common sense, we, it's a moonshot research, so we still don't know the full path yet. But one thing for sure, we cannot just get there by by making the tallest building in the world one inch taller, therefore GPT four, five, six may not cut it. When um, we need to do like this um, whole range of different uh, research programs, combining symbolic and neural representations, integrating knowledge into reasoning, and also constructing benchmarks, which are not just a categorization. Okay, so more stuff online. Um, we gave the first tutorial on common sense this year at ACL, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn. Um, I will make some very brief remarks and then ask a couple of questions before we go to the next panel. Um, so I see a lot of convergence in what people talked about today, which is great. And I think convergence should be the theme of the day. Um, there was convergence on the importance of thinking through what evolution has to say to the story, on counterfactuals, which is a topic that Danny is gonna pick up in his talk uh, on the cognitive psychology of counterfactuals, I guess. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on dealing with the unfamiliar and with open-endedness rather than just the things we've seen before. Deep learning is very good with the familiar, but not necessarily the unfamiliar. Um, there was a lot of convergence on the need to integrate knowledge. Uh, Judea made the point that data alone is not enough. We have to integrate it with knowledge in some fashion, which is also a theme in my um, uh, Next Decade article. Um, a lot of emphasis on common sense. Ye Yejin, uh, Yejin was uh, pointing in that same direction and she used the word generative, and I think that that describes a lot of the things that, that uh, people have talked about. Um, so I think it was a terrific session, a lot of different ideas. Um, there's also, I think, a question of integration and pluralism. And this is the first question I'll throw out um, to the panel is, okay, we've seen you know six or seven different perspectives on this. How are we gonna put all of those together? Do we wanna put all of those together? So can we make reinforcement learning compatible with knowledge, for example, is that something that we should be trying to do? So um, Lewis has raised a finger and I'll let him be the first person to jump in. Yes, um, neurosymbolic AI or neurosymbolic computing is not only, it's not about the how, um, it's not an implementation detail. Neurosymbolics about uh, representation, not about the how. Representation in a way precedes learning. If one wants to have, for instance, what uh, Yajeng mentioned re uh, recently, what is common sense with causal implications. So it's very important to understand that we have the same aims of, at building something uh, very solid in terms of computational theory, as Rich mentioned. Reinforcement learning, of course, plays a role in that, but we see that uh, representation precedes learning, which is something that's very important to have in mind. It's not only about data, as Jude has been saying, I read all of his papers and books, but uh, if one wants to, to have the aims and to pursue the objective that Rich has mentioned brilliantly, I think that one has to have in mind that in order to have effective neurosymbolic models or effective Rich AI models, one needs to consider that uh, proper knowledge representation reasoning and proper representation of the data and of the knowledge about the world precedes the learning procedures and uh, I have to stop here, otherwise other people will not uh, speak, Gary. Thank you. Who else would like to jump in? Um, or I, I can sharpen the question a little bit. Um, 
and I'll sharpen it for Rich in a way, which is, do we want one computational model here in the Mars sense, or are we actually looking for a pluralism? So people who have argued for modularity, like Steven Pinker, um, have argued that there are many different modules with different adaptive specializations. Um, so do we want to have a lot of different modules that have different properties, like a counterfactual reasoning module might work differently from a reinforcement model, or are we looking for a common framework here? Rich, go ahead. So uh, I could speak to that, yes. Um, reinforcement learning is a computational theory. I'm arguing that it's the first, but it is just the, it would be just the first. Um, there could be others. And you know, I really would welcome that. I would welcome other things that propose pro proposals of alternate ways of thinking about the overall problem, and not just uh, the representations, not just whether it's learned or innate, but what is it? What is it? What is the overall thing that we're trying to achieve, and how can we uh, uh, tie that to a, the computational theory level? Should be. Uh, coherent in and amongst itself. It should constrain itself. It, it should be analyzable at that level and we, it'd be great. We need, we need multiple uh, alternate theories, computational theories. And I'm gonna read an audience question or I'll, I'll adapt it slightly. Um, a bunch of people who submitted online questions wanted to know how do you work in causal frameworks when you have variables that are unfamiliar? And you know, one case would be you wanna reason about coronavirus 19 and you don't have it before, you don't have a pre-built system representing its causal relations to many factors. So, so how in that framework, and I guess this is a question uh, for Judea or, or Robert, what do you do with new variables? How, how do you uh, face them? Well, one thing I should uh, introduce at this point is that what we found is it, it, it takes so little and such primitive relationship to get so much. Namely, sometimes you need only relations such as uh, um, the drug doesn't change the sex of the subject, okay? To get a terrific mileage in the kind of inferences that you can draw on it without a simple relationship, right? That the drug doesn't change the sex of the object. You cannot do things, and with this qualitative, primitive, common sense relationship, you can do so much. And this is what's amazing that you need such a quality, only qualitative, uh, simple relationship to get such a huge spectrum of ability. And that answer your question: What do we need for? for corona, right? Simple epidemiological relationship of how disease propagate and how, what uh, relations are there between, uh, you know, what makes certain sources of information reliable and other not reliable. Just qualitative information, which is not too hard to program, hand program, can buy you a tremendous mileage. Robert, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I would say uh, something along the same lines. The, um, with the example of Corona, with, of, of COVID-19, it's a coronavirus. Oftentimes, you, well, in this case, we were able to go and find um, computational models of other coronaviruses and uh, build, build, build reason about them as causal models. And, and then as we were able to learn new things about this particular strain of coronavirus, we can update our model with that new uh, information and make inferences. Uh, it's also uh, a good example, I think, of um, you know, my call to, 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 to look towards uh, more probabilistic programming techniques because you know, some of the more uh, interesting models of uh, epidemics are uh, from epidemiology, they're dynamic models like SIR models or SCIR models, and those are those are dynamic models using differential equations. 
And so you might want to represent that kind of dynamic process explicitly uh, in code and uh, and still be able to reason, say, for example, counterfactually about it, like what would have happened had we instituted uh, a stay at home policy three weeks earlier, how many lives would we have saved, things like that. Um, generally speaking, there's a lot of, there's you, you encounter that a lot where you hit a problem and you're, you're unfamiliar with it, but there are abstractions that you can import from uh, similar domains. And then as you go, uh, you can, you can uh, refine those abstractions um, as, as new knowledge and new data come in. Yeah, Jin, I, you must have thought about causality a lot in constructing the databases and so forth that you've been working on. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, so um, I'll be a little bit controversial, although I'm also very much in line with what were uh, discussed so far by adding um, that some of the human causal reasoning is entirely flawed. I mean, we see that with the coronavirus as well and climate changes and, um, you know, humans are capable of believing strange things and do strange causal reasoning. Now, we need to make a very interesting decision here, which is that do we really want to build a human like intelligence or do we want to somehow find the, you know, conjunctive subset of what is more desirable between AI and human. But I think still, even if there are weaknesses with the human intelligence, there's something really fundamentally interesting about causal reasoning that humans do, which oftentimes, by the way, nobody needs to define coronavirus a variable for me. All the information that I get is ever transmitted to me in natural language. And I think this is really, really interesting capabilities that humans have in acquiring knowledge about how the world works without me actually being sick of a coronavirus. I still learn a great deal about it, even without interacting with it personally, I still learn a great deal about it just by reading language, textual descriptions. And I think this actually is one of the important challenges we need to address, including the nuanced and the somewhat unsound causal reasoning that we do all the time. And these were actually key points that um, I was making in my uh, pitch earlier as well, which is that when you reasoned that the two monsters are running as opposed to standing still on one foot, we just made uh, erroneous inference that may not be entirely true. Um, but that's really the gist of common sense causal reasoning that humans do all the time. And I have a question for Ken and Feifei, and then we'll go on to the next panel and Barbara. Um, you both mentioned evolution, and there's been a history of people playing around with evolution and neural networks and things like that. Ken has done some of the seminal work there. What's the status of, of that field right now? Is, is that going to be a big part of the next decade now that we have large computational resources? Uh, okay, that's a big question. Um, so yeah, when we called that neuroevolution, um, and um, I think that um, the real, the important thing about neuroevolution as a field within AI is um, whether we interpret it as sort of like a dogmatic push towards just using evolutionary algorithms, or if it's more viewed as kind of an attempt to understand why, like I mentioned in, in my talk, open-ended phenomena are so important and what allows them to actually perpetuate, which has sort of traditionally not been really what's been going on with, you know, so if we do evolutionary algorithms or genetic algorithms. And, and I think that caused some confusion about the motivations behind doing this kind of work. So, to, so we don't necessarily have this sort of dogmatic view, like you have to run evolution to get an interesting answer to something uh, from a reinforcement learning perspective or something like that. But rather there are properties of evolution, um, evolution in nature that are just so profoundly powerful and are not explained algorithmically yet because we cannot create phenomena like have been created in nature. Um, and those are properties that we should continue to chase and understand. And those are properties not only in evolution, but also within ourselves. As I tried to argue, there's a parallel between our own history of innovation and the innovation and evolution. And in that sense, yeah, I think we're gonna continue to pursue these kind of algorithms and also hybridize them uh, with others, including learning algorithms, um, because after all, that is, uh, that is the world in which we live, where there's an outer loop of evolution and inner loops of learning. Absolutely. So, hey, I'll give you the last word in, in uh, the first panel. Wow, that's a, a big honor. So first of all, totally agree with Ken and, and love everything I've heard. So evolution for me is one of the greatest, probably the greatest experimental setting of the 
uh, of the emergence of intelligence. But like Ken, I'm not dogmatic about it. Um, I still hold the dream as a scientist, or, or maybe it's through my physics training, that there is going to be a set of unifying principles of intelligence, either through nature, uh, either, you know, the these principles have guided certain um, amount of animal intelligence emergence, but will also uh, give, you know, uh, machine intelligence. And evolution is one of the greatest, richest experiment we have seen, and there's so much inspiration. But we're not, I'm not dogmatic about following the exact constraint, environmental constraints and, and uh, biological constraints of evolution. I, I want to distill the, 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 the principle uh, setups such as embodiment, interaction, um, multitask, uh, and et cetera. So we'll continue to really draw a lot of inspiration from evolution, but that's not an end goal, um, at least not in my pursuit. So it breaks my heart to have just told one of the panelists not to ask a question now, but I think we should do um, all three of our panels. So the next panel is going to be on insights from neuroscience and psychology. Let's see if some other fields can help us uh, sort all this out. And we're going to start with Barbara Traversky, who's a professor emerita uh, at Stanford University. She's a leading cognitive psychologist with a focus on visuospatial reasoning and events, although I don't see that in the bio here, and collaborative cognition. She's author of Mind in Motion, How Action Shapes Thoughts. Welcome, Barbara. You are muted. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. The talks have been awesome, and I'm thrilled to be here. So all living things must move and act in space to survive, even viruses. When motion ceases, life ends. Unlike viruses, people act in space in a multitude of ways. They push, pull, tear, throw, kick, and put together. And those actions on objects become actions on ideas. We push them forth, we pull them, we tear them apart, we put them together. They also get expressed in gestures that are miniatures of the actual actions, but again, they're acting on ideas, not on objects. Gestures that accompany explanations change our thought. Participants watched a video explaining how a car engine worked. One set of people watched just gestures that showed structure. Another watched gestures that showed the action of the engine. Those who saw structure gestures created visual explanations like the one on the left. Those who saw action gestures deeply internalized the action and produced diagrams like visual explanations, like the one on the right, that clearly divides the process into five parts. It shows the action, explosions, mixing gas and oxygen arrows in very vivid ways. So uh, over and above words, the gestures that we make change our thinking. The gestures that we make when we're thinking change our own thinking. This woman is alone in a room. She's reading a complicated description of an environment, placing many things in spatial relations. Watch her hands. She isn't watching them but her hands are creating a model of what she's reading. The words have an arbitrary relation to meaning, but the model she's creating has a direct relation to meaning. She's not looking at her hands. The model is motor, spatial motor, not visual. When she does this, she remembers better. When we tell people to sit in their hands, they remember worse. And some say, I can't think without my hands. This works not just for environments, it works for 
mechanical systems. It works for complicated scheduling. It works for linear orders and many other types of knowledge. Um, so learning, thinking, communication, cooperating, competing, all rely on actions and a few words. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, and I believe our next panelist is actually in the same room with you, um, which gives us one last video uh, to change. We, we next have Daniel Ta Kahneman, who is probably most of you know, uh, won a Nobel Prize in economics. He's professor emeritus uh, in multiple departments at Princeton, including, I just learned this, in the Woodrow Wilson School in addition to in psychology. And he's also the author of the best-selling uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and every time I go to New York, I try to have lunch with him and he always asks me hard questions. Maybe I'll get to return the favor today. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. Um, I was actually going to talk about counterfactuals and normality, uh, but it was a small talk. I was going to talk to you about how people undo events, which turns out to be a kind of counterfactual that's not the same as causal counterfactual. But listening to the talks of the first session, I decided that I should do something else, slightly more ambitious. Uh, and, and I should talk about two systems. I, I seem to be identified with the idea of two systems, system one and system two, although they're not my idea, but I did write a book that uh, described them. And as quite a few of you I'm sure know, uh, we talk about the contrast between one system that works fast, another that works slow. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, but the main difference between system one and system two, as I described them, was that system one is something that happens to you. You are not active. The thought that the words come to you, the ideas come to you, the emotions come to you, they happen to you, you do not do them. And the essential distinction that I was drawing uh, between the two systems was really that one, uh, something that happens to you and something that you do. High level of skills in my description of, of things were absolutely in system one. Anything that we can do automatically, anything that happens associatively, is in system one. Uh, another distinction between system one and system two, uh, as psychologists see them, is that operations of system one tend to be parallel, operations of system two tend to be serial. And I think that this idea of two systems may have been ad adopted uh, more than it should have been. And it seems to have been identified, uh, and that's what prompted me to change my talk today. It seemed to be identified with the distinction between symbolic and non-symbolic, where system one is non-symbolic and system two is symbolic, one that does the reasoning. Uh, and there is, I had a very similar view myself when you look at what machine learning does, it reminds you uh, that black box that produces miraculously and quite fast produces very complicated responses or, or responses in very complicated situations. But I think the mapping is actually seriously imperfect. So it's true that anything, any activity that we would describe as non-symbolic, I think does belong to system one. But system one I think cannot be described as a non-symbolic system. Uh, for one thing, uh, it's, it's much too complicated and rich for that. It knows language for one thing. Intuitive thoughts are in language. Uh, the most interesting component of system one, the basic component as I conceive of that notion is that it holds a representation of the world. And, and a representation that actually allows something that resembles a simulation of the world. 
as I describe it, we, we live with that representation of the world. And most of the time, we are in what I call the valley of the normal. There are events that we positively expect. There are events that surprise us. But most of what happens to us neither surprises us nor is it expected. What I'm going to, do, to say next will not surprise you, but you didn't actually expect it. So there is that model that compares, that accepts many, many events as normal continuations of what happens, but it rejects some. And it distinguishes what is surprising from what is normal. That's very difficult to describe in terms of symbolic or non-symbolic. Certainly what happens is a lot of counterfactual thinking is in fact system one thinking because surprise is something that happens automatically. You're surprised when something that happens is not normal, is not expected. And that forces common sense and causality to be in system one and not in system two. So I wanted just to uh, clarify the language a bit that it seems to me that uh, the association of system two specifically with symbolic and system one with non-symbolic. Uh, I really enjoy hearing those two systems mentioned in conversations about AI, but I'm not sure that they're always used as precisely as they should be. Thank you. That was a beautiful explanation. Um, clearest that I've heard you uh, make, make that point. Um, and I will now introduce uh, Doris Sal, who is at Caltech. Um, she's professor of biology there. She's an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, and she happened to have won the MacArthur Genius uh, Fellowship. Um, that's not its official name in 2018. Uh, and welcome, Doris. Thank you so much, Gary and Vincent, for inviting a humble monkey neurophysiologist to this wonderful gathering, thinking about the future of AI. It's really been inspiring. So the title of my talk is The Importance of Understanding Feedback, or How the Brain Models the World, the Key Element Missing from Our Current Neuroscientific Understanding. So I recently learned that in the very first paper on neural networks, McCulloch and Pitts already grappled with what they called nets with circles. They recognize that the brain contains speed forward and feedback connections. And my central thesis today is that understanding the purpose of these feedback connections will be critical for both understanding and engineering intelligence. I'll highlight four specific instances where understanding feedback could help us build better AI systems. Uh, first, the biggest lesson machine learning has taught us is that learning is critical to wire up intelligent systems. Artificial networks learn through backprop. How does the brain learn? And could this provide a new mechanism for learning in artificial systems? So one beautiful idea for how learning can occur in the brain is through predictive coding. And the scheme provides a means for unsupervised learning, since now all you need to do is predict your input image. And it also generates an explicit error signal locally within each area that can drive synaptic weight changes without the need for propagating error derivatives. A second, understanding feedback may allow us to build more robust vision systems by enforcing consistency between discriminative and generative models of the world. For example, if you think that you're seeing the letter seven, you can try to regenerate the image and check if it agrees with the actual image. Third, I think understanding feedback is the key to understanding the binding problem. Namely, how does the brain link representations of the same object across different brain areas? This is a foundation for symbolic reasoning and understanding the brain's solution may give us insights into how to build it into machines. And finally, understanding feedback will let us understand the mechanism behind mental imagery, hallucinations, dreams, and other strange psychological processes that have been suggested to relate to our creative abilities. So incorporating these processes might result in more creative AIs. And Mother Nature has handed us a remarkable gift for understanding cortical feedback, which is the macaque face patch system. This is a set of regions in the macaque brain dedicated to processing faces. And it has two properties which make it ideal for understanding the function of cortical feedback. A first, it constitutes a hierarchical network of nodes connected through both feed forward and feedback connections. And second, we understand reasonably well the representation used by each node, which is a prerequisite for understanding the function of feedback. Because even if we could record from feed forward and feedback neurons separately, if we didn't understand their representations, we'd have no idea how to compare their activities. 
And finally, we recently showed that the face patch system provides a model for a vast swath of IT cortex. So whatever we find for the face patches will likely generalize to all of object vision. And I don't know what we will find, but I think that figuring out the function of the feedback pathways in the monkey visual system is going to reveal important constraints for how to optimally incorporate feedback in artificial systems. And I'm very excited about the exchange between machine learning and systems neuroscience towards this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Adam Marblestone, who is a Schmidt Futures Innovation Fellow. He's a former research scientist at Google DeepMind. Um, he works on connections between AI and neuroscience. And I will just say that writing a paper with him uh, called Atoms of Neural Computation, which was in science in 2014, was one of the most stimulating uh, projects of my career. Um, uh, I, I welcome Adam Marblestone. Thank you, Gary. It was, it was one of mine, too. It was around the holidays, around 2014, I recall, if we were working on that. Um, so I, I, I would describe myself as a, a maximalist uh, in, in terms of ways that I think neuroscience and cognitive science can, uh, can impact AI. So I, I don't intend what I say to be exclusionary uh, to, to any of what anyone else is saying here. Uh, and I also think that this is only part of the picture um, and that you know, computer science and, and pure AI approaches also have a lot to say. But what I wanna do in, in this talk is just highlight one area of neuroscience that I think may be emerging to have the potential to impact AI, but has so far been kind of neglected um, for both for lack of data and, and uh, just because there's been very few papers actually trying this. So, so the conventional perspective, if you will, if I can call it that on, on how neuroscience would inform AI is this idea of mechanistic, getting mechanistic insight from neuroscience. And this, I think is reflected in the last talk on, on feedback and the face patch system. But the basic idea is make observations of the brain, try to abstract that to a, a theory of, of functioning of different circuits in the brain and how they work. Right now, we're at a fairly primitive ability to do this. So we, we have many different theories, even looking at the same uh, cortical microcircuit structure, which is only now partially being understood or even measured. Um, that same theory, such as that same same data, such as we understand it now, uh, can map on to, depending on who you ask, a number of different ideas, graphical models, biological implementations of backpropagation, uh, what Gary and I were writing about of sort of modular uh, reconfigurable circuits, or uh, or some people maybe think that it's it's actually not it's we're, we're it's hopeless to to actually figure this out. Um, so there are a number of possibilities. I think as we get deeper data about this, they will start to make more unique predictions that will be more falsifiable. Um, but what I want to do is connect this back from this kind of mechanistic neuroscience view to something that maybe connects more directly to how deep learning researchers think today and conduct research today. So with a few exceptions, I would say, in, in deep learning research, much of the, uh, many of the impressive kind of real world examples like image classification or, or rich natural language, they come from using big human derived data, basically copying human behavior whether that be copying humans' choices as far as classifying images or co copying the utterance statistics of natural language and something like GPT-3. And recently uh, in, in some cool papers from DeepMind, for example, copying uh, or doing what's called behavioral cloning on interactions between humans as one human is teaching another human uh, to interact in an in embodied setting. All of these rely on human behavioral data as a key component of the training. There are some exceptions now where you don't rely on any human data, where you're trying to bootstrap entirely using reinforcement learning, uh, amazing one in, in nature uh, this week where, where uh, they're doing model-based model, model uh, based reinforcement learning with a learned model um, uh, on Atari. Um, that's, that's an amazing example where it doesn't really use human data. Um, but what I wanna suggest is that there is an aspect of neuroscience that, that hasn't been used um, as a source of data for directly using that as a supervision signal or training signal, and that is the actual brain activity itself. So what, what's shown on the right here is from now almost 10 years ago, Jack Gallant's lab at Berkeley 
taking fMRI uh, activity patterns in the, in the human brain and using that to decode what image the person is looking at. Um, that's a big expensive MRI machine. Meanwhile, there have been developments in making uh, brain activity scanning in, in humans much more accessible, portable, cheap. What if we could actually directly use the human brain activity as a teaching signal where we say, when I look at an image, not only do I match how that person classifies the image, is it a dog or is it a cat, but I actually directly try to make the AI uh, predict the full activity pattern in that person's brain. Could that be used as a source of a dense teaching signal coming from uh, neuroscience? And there's only a handful of papers about this, but I'll point you to, to one from uh, David Cox's group where they were using human brain activity to, to guide uh, image classification algorithms. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Adam. Our next speaker, the last one for this panel is Christoph Koch, who's the president and chief scientist of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. Um, he's also done a lot of work on consciousness and written several uh, books, uh, some of which are on consciousness, including uh, Consciousness Confessions of a Romantic Redu Reductionist. I've always loved that title. Um, and also the, the amazing book, The Biophysics of Computation. Um, in addition to all that, he's co-written several articles with me, including my one and only uh, published science fiction essay. Um, little known fact about Christoph. Welcome, Christoph. You're muted. Yeah, okay. You don't see your slides though. How about, how about now? They're beaming in. Now we see them, yep. Okay. Yeah, so I'm here at the Allen Institute, which incidentally is not the same Allen Institute that Ye Yin Choi talked about. We are both started by Paul Allen, but we're the Allen Institute for, for, for brain science. We, we, uh, we face each other, uh, we are in view of each other, but uh, we're independent institutes. So we, fo uh, we, uh, we focus on, on biology. And um, over the... Um, At the Allen Institute, we carry out these very large scale uh, foundational surveys of the anatomical, genomic and, and physiological architectures of brains. In particular, we focus on the brains of mice, of monkeys and on, uh, on, uh, on human. And all this data is published in high impact journals and made freely and publicly accessible. So the point I'm trying to make here is that these massive resources re reveal brains made out of uh, amazing complexity, none of which is reflected in any uh, machine learning models or in any of the current models of AI. Uh, what, what this uh, reveals, including the, the connectomes that we are now getting both uh, the complete connectomes of cubic millimeters of tissue, both in the mouse and in the, in the humans, they reveal that these brains are, are not only made out of millions or billions of neurons and glia cells, not just excitatory and inhibitory cells, but a, a, a fantastic, just a, a mind blowing variety of cell types on the order of now we estimate a thousand different cell types, neuronal cell types that differ by the developmental origin, that differ by the genes they express, the layer in which their cell bodies is located, which is critical to understand anything in cortex, the addresses they send the information to, that differ in the synaptic architecture, in the, the, in the dendritic trees, in the, um, in the electrophysiological functions, et cetera. So we have you know, highly heterogeneous individual components, roughly a thousand times, that combine both the functionality of computation and memory, so very different than our current you know, uh, VLSI hardware, into these densely interwoven networks with fan in and fan out on the order of 10,000. All right. So this really exceeds anything that science has ever has ever studied with these highly heterogeneous components on the order of a thousand, with with connectivity on the order of ten thousand. Uh, you know, as I say, that the brain is the most highly organized piece of active matter in the in the known universe. And if I look at the state of the art, you know, deep neural networks. 
they're really very impoverished and by um, a they're very impoverished so by and large they have you know halfway rectified or you know gain control saturating units so two or three different types compared to a thousand different types that we see in the brain and of course um, as Doris also emphasized the, the the vast majority of them are essentially feed forward with maybe some weak uh, feedback in the brain with the possible exception of the retina there's nothing that isn't massively uh, feedback not only weakly modulated but massive um, uh, feedback and so understanding brains and their pathologies uh, is a project probably that's going to take us a century or two we believe now it looks like if you look at pathologies like uh, neurological diseases or psychiatric diseases they're very often pathologies of individual cell types. And so that's why the sensors of these different cell types in, in, in across all mammals, because it turns out they're very similar, whether you're looking in a mouse, a human, or a monkey cortex, they, they, you can identify sometimes one-to-one -one matching cell types in the mouse, in the monkey, and in the, uh, and in the human. Um, so understanding brains and their pathology is, uh, is going to take a very long time, much longer than the time scale that AI in the industry is operating uh, under. And this is illusion of the, uh, you know, we have this exponential growth in neuroscience data, but that really obscures the underlying sublinear growth in our understanding of the principles of brain science. I'm not talking about cognitive science. I'm not talking about developmental uh, uh, psychology or psychology in general. I'm really talking about the physical substance of our minds, either the brain. And the dirty secret of my field is that we don't like to talk about. We have a connector with a complete wiring diagram of C. elegans since 1986. Okay, that's the third of a century. There's still no general purpose integ uh, integrated model of, of, of its three to two neurons, right? And here we're trying to understand the 16 billion neurons that make up the, and the, um, and the human uh, brain. So, so, so I think it's a mistake to look for inspiration. And so here I differ from my immediate predecessor, Adam, to look at the, the mechanistic substrate of the mind, the brain, to help speed up AI. I think, I think that's a mistake. Uh, that's a mistake because the, the constraint that biology had to operate under, metabolic constraint, developmental constraint, evolutionary constraint, it's just radically different from the constraints that, that you know, an engineered artifact operates on, uh, under. Oh. And, and, and we, we don't really understand the relationship. If I look at a cross species now, we don't really understand the relationship um, in, of intelligence. You know, how does it change? How intelligent is something? Because we don't have a good definition that only a three two neurons, like a C. elegans, but that's been around for several hundred million years, compared to the intelligence of a bee that has a, a million neurons, compared to the intelligence of a mouse that has a hundred million neurons, compared to the intelligence of Homo sapiens that you know has on the order of hundred billion neurons. Or even if we look within a single species like humans or dogs or mouse, it has been done in these three species, trying to ascertain some measure of intelligence like the generalized G factor or IQ factor, things like that, and how that changes across variability in number of neurons, mass of the brain, thickness of cortex. We don't really understand that at all. And so there are these weird puzzles that Neanderthal had a bigger brain than we had, but we were supposedly their superior, you know, we survived and they didn't. I, if I look at the brain of pilot whales, their cortex, not just the entire brain, but their cortex is twice as large as our cortex. They have 37 billion cortical neurons compared to our 16 billion cortical neurons. So why are we the dominant species and not these pilot, um, and these pilot uh, whales? So I think uh, we, we, we need to look towards uh, psychology and cognitive science and, de and developmental psychology for inspiration that'll help further power. Brains primarily provide existence proof that adaptive intelligence is possible in physical hardware. Thank you very much for that provocative talk, Christoph. Um, kind of a note of intellectual humility for the entire field. <laughs> um, which I appreciate. Unusual, I know. <laughs> um, I will make a personal remark and then ask some questions. The personal remark is I have always felt like we will figure out AI before neuroscience. I think, you know, I'm well known for my skepticism about AI, but I think you're making measurable progress, if slow there. And neuroscience just seems so hard 
Um, and I think we're going to need computers help in order to understand all the data once we even figure out what the critical data are. Um, so here, here's my first question. Which, I'll start with the neuroscientist and then I'll go to the psychologist. For the neuroscientist, um, at least Adam and Christoph know the paper I wrote with Adam, and I don't know if Doris know, knows it or not, but the contention of that, that paper was that the quest for a single canonical cortical circuit might be a mistake and that we might be looking, ought to be looking for greater diversity in, you know, maybe there's not just one column circuit that's identical everywhere. And the empirical data, I think, has been relatively charitable to what Adam and I have said, but I haven't followed it that closely the last few years. So um, I, I noticed a hint of that in Doris is saying, you know, if we figure out this piece of visual cortex, it'll tell us a lot about other pieces of visual cortex. How far would you like to take that, Doris? And I'll, I'll take Christoph and Adam after that. Like, do you think that's going to tell us anything about prefrontal cortex, or do you think the boundary is there? Yeah, I think if you look at the structure of the brain, you know, one piece of the brain really looks physically like another piece, right? The six layers, the cell types, there's some variability, but overall what really strikes you is the similarity. So I, I definitely think that there's, you know, some really deep general principles about how the brain is organized that, you know, transcend what, which, you know, whether you're in visual cortex or auditory cortex and even um, between sensory and um, cognitive parts of the brain. And, you know, I think, for example, predictive coding is this really, you know, this normative model that can explain many, many things, right? Like unsupervised learning for all, you know, all kinds of um, abilities. Um, so, you know, there's undoubtedly going to be differences, but I, I really think like seeking this general principle um, is going to be very powerful. Adam, well, so I, I, I have to agree and disagree with Doris. Yes, there's similarity. So the, in both a, v, a visual cortex and prefrontal cortex, they are focused on primal cells and interneurons. But if you look at actually the cell type as determined by single cell transcriptomics or other measures, they're quite different. Visual neurons do not map onto neurons in prefrontal cortex. In that sense, they're different. So, and those differences are probably significant. How important are they to understand computation? That remains to be shown. We don't no. Adam? Right. Well, I, I, I don't want to claim an answer. I, I think if anything, you know, from when we were writing that paper, Gary, I, since writing that, I think my, my view on the possibility that there would be unifying, if you want, learning, learning principles, um, rather than a need for a sort of a, a very diverse set of, of modular bricks, uh, computational bricks, um, has maybe moved more towards it, the idea of universal learning algorithms as I spent more time interacting with the AI researchers. But, but I think that the point is we need to get better data. Um, and I, I hope it doesn't take a century to figure it out, but I think we, it will take some, some time to, to understand empirically, yeah, the computational significance, as Christoph said, of, of these differences that you do find. So good thing I wrote that paper with the Adam of 2014. <laughs> All right, question for the psychologist. Um, I realize as, as we're doing this and realized a few days ago, um, we don't have as many uh, developmental psychologists here, although Celeste is one. I'll, I'll throw this question out to her as well, even though she's in the third panel. Um, so um, the big developmental question is always about innateness. And I'm gonna ask some specific forms of this for Danny and Barbara, and then maybe Celeste will join in. Danny, one of the things you're not as famous for as the system one and system two, but I think is profoundly affected cognitive psychology is the notion of object files that you did with um, Ann Treisman. Um, and the way I've always sort of um, caricatured that is you have to have an index card in your head for each of a bunch of things that you're tracking. And um, they're kind of like files for events. These, these properties are there. And I've always imagined those to be innate. Have I recapped the, the notion correctly? And do you think of this as an innate architecture or something that's learned? And you guys are muted. Well, uh, object files, the idea of object files was when you track an object, it can change, and yet it remains the same object. And and there is a, a given number of objects that we of object file that we can uh, retain or at the same time. Uh, by the way, the notion came from police file, 
I mean, the police has opened the file for a case, and then the content of that file keeps changing, but uh, it's the same file. And the number is quite limited, and I do believe that that idea of maintaining objects is surely innate. Hard to imagine how it could be otherwise. In Innate. In, in standard kind of deep learning architectures, there really aren't the equivalent of object files where you can accumulate properties about an entity over time. Um, there are various workarounds, but that's always struck me as an issue. And there's a whole chapter in my book, The Algebraic Mind, is actually built on the object file idea and type token distinction and so forth. Barbara, my version for you is how much of a Kantian are you? So Kant tried to argue that time and space, I don't remember what he said about events, it's been too long. At least time and space, he argued, essentially psychologizing him, were innate. Are, are you down with that? Um, what's your view? You've thought a lot about representations of time and space. My guess is you think some of them change over time, but some are innate. Am I right? So I, I have trouble with innate. I even have trouble with object files being innate in, in babies because of object permanence. They, it takes a while to learn that an object that goes behind a barrier is the same object coming out. So it feels to me like I'm uncomfortable with that, um, with that sharp dichotomy between what's innate and what's acquired, because so much of what is, seems to be innate depends on experience. Um, as Fei-Fei talked about Held's work with the two kittens, and to develop visual learning, you need to act in the world. So it, I'm never sure what is exactly meant by that's innate. And maybe you can clarify that a bit. I saw Celeste wrinkling her nose at the same moment I wanted to. So I'll let Celeste go first, then maybe I'll throw in a word. Yeah, so I, uh, uh, echoing echoing the points that, that Dr. Uh, Kahneman and Dr. Tversky made, the, the, I also have a, a little bit of a problem um, making sense of what it means for it to be innate. Uh, I think we have ample evidence that uh, infants' attentional systems are ready to handle objects very early. Uh, I've wrinkled my nose a little bit on the, the infants learning uh, object permanence because while I do think there, there's a lot of evidence that it takes a while to learn various properties of objects, uh, we're also limited in terms of what we can detect that an infant knows. Uh, and as we've developed new methodologies that depend on gaze, uh, what we continue to discover is that infants are actually capable of um, understanding a lot more about objects than we used to, we used to think. Um, one point that I wanted to add on to, to, to everything that's already been said is that uh, an alternative to sort of the object files type of theory uh, is something that is more maybe bandwidth. You could think of it limited. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of work by people like George Alvarez and Ed Vol, suggesting that there is an upper limit on how much information you can process in a moment, uh, but that it's not uh, specifically strictly tied to the number of objects. The number of objects you can track uh, depends upon things like the complexity of the objects and also how, how rapidly uh, they're moving. So um, uh, yeah, that's it. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go to the third panel and then we're gonna have fun when everybody joins at the end, sort of like at the end of a rock <laughs> concert. And so we can continue some of those discussions then. But Celeste is actually our next speaker in the third panel, which is called towards AI we can trust. And I think, you know, there's a set of constraints on how we build our AI in terms of, we want them to be open-ended and flexible and so forth. We also want them to be ethical and trustworthy. And Celeste is gonna lead off this panel. Um, she's a professor at UC Berkeley. She was among the silence breakers who were named Time Person of the Year in 2017. Um, and I think her work on belief formation is critical in the current world that is inundated with misinformation. So take it away, Celeste. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, that is what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, my lab at UC Berkeley studies how humans form beliefs and build knowledge in the world. Uh, in particular, we focus on how humans navigate the vast seas of all the possible information that they could try to make sense of in the world. Uh, one second. Oh, sorry, a little delay. Um, uh, the thing that I'd like to emphasize today is that algorithmic bias is not only problematic 
for the direct harms that it causes, uh, but also for the cascading harms of how it impacts human beliefs. This is problematic because there are systems interfacing with people every day, embedded seamlessly in our lives. These systems drive human beliefs in sometimes destructive and likely irreparable ways. What our research has shown is that people don't learn deeply about most things. People have to make up their minds quickly uh, in order to act. And once a person has made up their mind about something, they don't easily revise. Uh, cognitive mechanisms kick in that dissuade them from revisiting the same topics, likely in the interest of focusing instead on new things. With that knowledge about how people work in mind, now consider content recommendation AI. Content serving algorithms on news and social media recommend content based on likelihood of user engagement, thus leading users to see content that espouses homogenous and sometimes rather wild beliefs. This is especially problematic when users go to these sources while they are unsure in order to collect information that they're going to use in order to make up their minds. These systems run the risk of pushing users towards stronger, inaccurate beliefs that, uh, despite our best efforts, are, are very difficult to correct. Here's just one more example. Uh, Amazon and LinkedIn have both been caught employing technologies that promote men and filter out qualified women job candidates. But the harms went beyond just the particular women in these pools. Uh, these systems almost certainly impacted the beliefs of the recruiters that were using the systems. If their searches didn't turn up qualified women, they likely concluded that qualified women didn't exist, when in truth, it was a bias in the applicant selection system. The point here is that biases in AI systems reinforce and strengthen biases in the people who use them. I wanna close by saying that right now is a terrifying time for ethics in AI. The termination of Timnit Gebru from Google marks a dark turn. Even after Me Too and the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests, it's clear that private interests will not support diversity, equity, and inclusion. It should horrify us that the control of algorithms that drive so much of our lives remain in the hands of a homogenous, narrow-minded minority. What Timnit experienced at Google is the norm. Uh, it's hearing about it that's unusual. It's also unfortunately the norm that people who speak about inconvenient truths to power are discarded. They're quietly pushed out by institutions like Google who, if caught, pretend that people like Timnit did something wrong. This manipulates everyone's beliefs into thinking that underrepresented people are underrepresented because they cause trouble, not because institutions themselves discriminate. But you should listen to Timnit and countless others about what the environment at Google was like. Jeff Dean should be ashamed. The rest of us have a responsibility to see this for what it is and insist that it stop. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for that. And um, I had really hoped to have Timnit here today, but she's obviously busy with a lot of things. Right. But the next best thing to having Timnit here is Margaret Mitchell, who is at Google and who was co-author with Timnit of a, a paper very relevant to all of that um, in, on large language models, also with Emily Bender. Um, and that paper was just accepted yesterday. And I think this would be a great opportunity to hear a little bit about what's in it. Um, so welcome, Margaret. Yeah, um, and hopefully you guys can see everything okay. Um, so uh, I'm Margaret Mitchell, otherwise known as Tim Neat's co-lead um, at Google. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking a bit about what we were up to um, that has gotten us into this mess today. Um, so uh, the sort of typical approach to developing machine learning systems uses the sort of uh, four tiered model where you have training data collected and annotated then the model is trained, uh, media then can be filtered, there's post-processing steps, um, and then people see the output. Um, but rather than this sort of clear pipeline uh, that can just be applied by engineers um, without sort of further consideration, 
there's human bias coming in uh, from the very start. So this is things like um, racism and sexism already inherent in the data that we're collecting. Um, and then there's further bias in how we collect that data, where we're sampling the data from um, and how we're getting things annotated. Um, and this propagates throughout uh, the rest of development. It's not undone. Um, it further affects model training. Uh, and then further in model training, there's further biases and value decisions about what's worth prioritizing on and what's worth not prioritizing. So for example, uh, what loss function you use is is putting in a value statement of what is is worth doing well on and what is not worth doing well on. Um, there are then human biases in how things should be post processed or generated. Um, and then people see the output and start to act on that output. And, uh, you know, to Celeste's point as well, this then becomes a feedback loop. As you, uh, as you see more and more models confirming your pre-existing beliefs, you hone in on those beliefs more and more and then create more data that then is used to train further models, really creating sort of polarization around different human biases. So we were trying to break this system. Um, we call it bias laundering. <laughs> Um, I'm really excited to share this slide because it has this awesome graphic I'm very proud of. Um, but the main idea that what we were focusing on is that development is value laden and um, there's no such thing as uh, neutrality in development. There's not this idea that like algorithms are, are neutral or programming is apolitical. Everything packs in human biases and different value judgments. Um, and the difficulty is that the different kinds of decisions that are made will affect different people differently. And so one of the fundamental parts of developing AI ethically is to make sure that um, from the start, there is a diversity of perspectives and backgrounds at the table. So defining what the problems are, what needs to be looked at, um, as well as things like how to collect the data. Um, so people who are deeply affected by these technologies are often not uh, considered as part of the development process. Um, and this is one of the things that we've been trying to work on operationalizing. Um, so how do we do this? So one of the approaches here, there are lots of different approaches, but one of the ways that we've been approaching this is in terms of breaking down the space of development into the different factors involved in that development. So there are different things at play, right? There's like the model you're using, there's like what you're thinking about that you want the model to do, there's the data, there's, there's all this stuff, right? And so we've been working on, um, you know, frameworks to coherently go through all of these different kinds of considerations in order to make make bare, make make clear what things are already being packed into system development, with the hope that once you can, you know, reflect on all of these deep nuanced details, you're able to uh, develop in a more informed way, working towards uh, foreseeable benefits and not being hampered by foreseeable harms and risks. Um, and so getting into this requires things like articulating what harms and risks are, right? Um, it's very difficult for tech to do this. Uh, tech as a whole generally is very good at benefits, uh, extolling the benefits and solutions of tech. Um, and so one of our sort of unique, uh, you know, contributions in this space was to do things like honing in on different foreseeable harms, foreseeable risks, and tying it to the long-term effects of, of different models. Um, so uh, recently there has been particular concerns around language models. Um, OpenAI released a couple language models that were massively powerful, um, generating large spans of fluent natural language. Um, Gary talked about this in the opening. Um, and you know, we consulted with them. They ended up doing these model card framework thing, this model card framework thing that we had been developing. Um, but where we got stuck was, well, we know there are issues, but what are those issues, right? We want to talk about potentials for misuse, but what is the source where we find those things? Um, so one of the you know, endeavors that we had been working on was articulating specifically harms and risks. So this is sort of neatly fitting within the overall uh, paradigm of um, uh, 
ethical processes or you know how you operationalize ethics and development focusing in specifically on the subtopic of harms and risks thinking about the general purpose models language models and detailing the harms and risks therein um, and then this this ended up uh, just very recently um, getting Timnit fired um, I am also an author on the paper Timnit and Emily Bender are uh, co-first authors um, but you know you wouldn't think it would be that uh, radical to put foresight into a development process. Um, but I think we're seeing now just how very serious that is and just how little value uh, companies are placing on the expertise and backgrounds of their workers. Um, so one of the key things that uh, that I've been working on, that Tamit has been working on, that we're really trying to push forward in the ethical AI space is the role of foresight and how that can be uh, incorporated into all aspects of development. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Francesca Rossi. She is an IBM fellow and AI ethics global leader. She's a board member of the Partnership of AI. She's the triple AI president elect. She's a leader both in some hardcore technical work on constraint satisfaction and also in AI ethics. And I once had the pleasure of co-editing a special issue of AI magazine with her on beyond the Turing test. And I hear that um, she is trying to punish me by making me uh, co-edit another special issue of AAA. Yes. <laughs> Maybe she will talk me into it. Well, you just committed, yeah. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, well, um, okay, let me say, let me tell you about my experience, you know, in dealing with trust and uh, AI ethics in general. And also uh, what I think are some uh, main points, so some of them are technical and some of them are not in really achieving this uh, ecosystem of trust around AI. So this is the overall picture that I think that many of the previous panelists uh, put forward. You know, we want a future, I would say of and with AI, because of course I don't think as AI, uh, at, at AI as just autonomous systems, but also systems that work with us. So it's not just the future of AI for me, but also with AI. Uh, and it has all these uh, uh, desirable uh, properties. So of course, trustworthiness is one, but of course, general collaborative and as already mentioned for GDP3 and language, very huge language model, also sustainably uh, and computationally. But how to focus on this third panel, how do we build an ecosystem of trust? And I, and I talk about an ecosystem of trust because it has many dimensions, just like trusting other people has many dimensions. So of course we want AI system to be accurate and that's, but beyond accuracy, we really want a, a lot of desirable properties. One of them I called it, and uh, some other people call it value alignment, uh, which is around fairness. You know, what, how do we want these uh, um, uh, machines to behave? To behave according to some values that we care about. One of them of course is fairness. So we want uh, bias to be identified, removed and so on. But it may have maybe other values that are beyond fairness, uh, robustness also, you know, generalizability beyond, you know, uh, some data distribution and explainability. Explainability is very important, especially in the context of machines that work together with human beings. Um, now, but uh, differently from what we would expect in building trust with another human being, here we are not in, in, uh, in the presence of another human being. We are the presence of AI systems that are created by human beings. So, so just like Margaret and others have said, we want something also from those that create that AI system, from the developers, from the deployers, from those that use the AI. And one of the things that I think Margaret pointed out very clearly, and we have a very similar approach, is we want transparency. We want transparency about the decision decisions that have been made during the AI pipeline, whether they are decision about the training data or other decision. And in that very vi nice visual way, Margaret showed that bias can be injected in many different uh, places in the AI pipeline. Uh, we don't have the uh, concept of a model card, but a very similar one called the AI fact sheet. And in fact, we work together with Margaret and 
others also within the partnership on AI to compare and learn from each other these different ways to achieve uh, um, uh, transparency. The second point that I want to make is that, uh, of course, uh, we want these developers also to work according to some AI ethics and uh, guidelines and principles, but principles are just the first step in, in, a, in a corporate uh, place where AI is being produced and deployed. So it really needs a lot of multi-stakeholder consultation, education, training, and as Margaret already mentioned, diverse teams, you know, to bring all many different backgrounds. It needs a lot of technical tools, for example, to detect and mitigate bias, to generate explanation and so on. It needs a lot of work in helping developers understand how to change the way they're doing things how to make it as easy as possible to adopt the new methodology and how to build an overall governance in a company within, you know, that is a kind of an umbrella over what developers are doing, what the business units are doing and so on. So it's really a process. And that's why I put this picture of trust with all the cranes because it's a process to build trust in AI. Uh, so the last point that I want to make is that uh, for all these properties that we want in the AI systems in order to be able to trust them, unfortunately, current AI is not there yet, does not provide all that we need to make AI trustworthy. And many of the capabilities that we have been discussing in the previous panels about advancing AI, just not for the, for the purpose of being trustworthy, are also very important as essential to make AI trustworthy. Worthy. So, for example, neurosymbolic uh, um, uh, AI has been considered already, has been talked uh, so much, uh, as well as uh, System 1 and System 2 that I agree completely with Danny is not neuro versus symbolic because uh, in, in, so it's uh, uh, the neuro AI as as is lacking a lot of system one capabilities, but that machinery that we use in human beings is important to be able to model and embed human values in a machine or to understand how machines can follow different ethics theory like more deontologist like or more consequentialist that are more you know on the autonom autonom or auto autonomatic or more on the considerate and deliberate thing. Causality has been mentioned already essential for explainability, for having interventions rather than just prediction, which is needed if you want to work with the, uh, between human beings and machines um, in, a, in a trusted team. Uh, explicit knowledge, high level concept, otherwise we cannot share within team members, you know, the, the knowledge and communicate at the right level. Epistemic planning and reasoning, if you are in a multi-agent uh, team environment, as well as introspection, metacognition to achieve the kind of global reasoning that is needed to be also general, models of the words, others and self, that has been mentioned already, that, Without that, we cannot have adaptability, generalization, and so on, as well as modeling a human reasoning models, not really for the purpose of uh, replicating human beings, but really for the purpose of being able to work well with a human being in a team. But as was said already very explicitly in the, in the previous panel, human and machines are very different platforms. They have very different embodiments. So it's not that clear that what works for what enables the kind of reasoning that we see in human beings is the same thing that will enable it in a machine. So that has to be understood better or at least tried and tested. And as I said, you know, system one is really not just ML and system two is not just symbolic AI. So that is also another big difference. So we really need to define what system one and system two is in a machine in order to understand how to achieve the desired human capabilities uh, and we want to that we want in a machine as well to be trusted so overall i think that the message is that it has to be very multidisciplinary approach but also very multi-stakeholder approach to hear all the voices thanks absolutely agree and our last speaker of the day is ryan callow um who's the maybe the only person here i have not met before but i've been admiring uh, some of the stuff he's put, posting on Twitter. He's one of the first people I noticed is, as a legal scholar to really dive deep into AI. He's a professor of law 
um, at UW. We have a lot of representation from UW today, at University of Washington. Um, welcome, Ryan. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, so this is a very uh, knowledgeable and and sober-eyed group, um, and so. But if you listen closely to many proponents of artificial intelligence, you begin to hear a kind of a paradox. And it's that AI is gonna change everything, but nothing should change. That is, AI is gonna fundamentally remake society, healthcare, finance, education, but there should be next to no change to law or legal institutions. In fact, such a change might be ruinous. So how do we explain this? Well, as these same proponents point out, AI is not a single thing. It's not an artifact like a train uh, or a railway station. Rather, AI is a set of techniques aimed at approximating some aspect of human or animal cognition using machines. You can't regulate AI as such. So instead, the thought runs, what we need to navigate this sea change is a common understanding of values. In other words, we need the principles. The after the <laughs> well, I think we have uh, someone else unmuted. Um, the, it's commonly said that we'll get, uh, we'll get AV right before AI. Um, so the thought is that we need principles. And you just heard Francesca talk about, about principles. Indeed, principles abound. Everybody has them. Governments, industry especially, NGOs, but also religious organizations, grassroots organizations, principles are everywhere. So I have a few problems with principles. First, to the extent that they draw their force from ethics, ethics is famously contestable. Both Bentham, and Kant, though they had dramatically different moral systems, get to say should. Second, principles are not self-enforcing. No, no tangible penalties attached to violating them. You violate the law and you lose money, property, maybe your freedom. You violate an ethical principle and you get criticized on Twitter. But fundamentally, my view is that principles are largely meaningless because in practice, they are designed to make claims that no one seriously disputes. Does anyone think that AI should be unsafe or inequitable? And if so, you know, are principles gonna change their mind? So I don't think we need principles to resolve the paradox that I'm describing. I think what we need to do at this point is roll up our sleeves and assess precisely how AI changes human affordances, what people can do and how they can do it, and then adjust our system of laws to this change. Merely because AI can't be regulated as such doesn't mean that we cannot or should not change many aspects of the law in response to it. And I have a lot of specific ideas like along those lines. Of it. That's what I research. I research precisely what about law and legal institutions ought to be changing. Now, there is, of course, another alternative. We could just stop taking claims of AI revolution seriously. That is to say, we could say that AI is not such a big deal, in which case, of course, human law can afford to safely ignore it. But if we're serious about AI changing everything, or even a lot, then I don't think it's just a matter of principles. I think it's time to get work on rules and otherwise that people won't ultimately trust AI enough to realize its benefits. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, my own view about ethics in AI is that it has to start in part, and I like the way Francesca put this, with, with some technical innovation. So there has to be all of the stakeholder and ecosystem stuff that I think we heard excellent arguments for but there also has to be some technical advances for it to have any hope. So if we just use big data alone without knowledge to borrow something that Judea said very nicely earlier, 
I don't think we can make it work. You think about Asimov's principles, do no harm. You need to compute what harm is in order to even get off the ground. And you know, my day job now is, is running a robotics company and many of the same issues come up for us. So we need transparency. We need reliable, deep understanding to use the term that Judea and I uh, both like. Um, you need to have those things in order to even get off the ground in robotics and you need them to get off the ground, I, th I think, in building an ethical system. And part of what Ryan was saying is, is kind of a um, Pandora's box. I think the box is open now. And my view is we're actually in the worst moment in AI history in a certain sense, which is we didn't have to deal with AI and all the biases and so forth 40 years ago because there wasn't really any AI. And I think eventually we can solve these problems. We can build systems that can reason. I think ethics is a form of reasoning um, and we will be able to build that. But right now we have these systems that are basically slavish to data without the knowledge um, and that makes them dangerous. And so I think we do need to have regulations for that. Regulations might need to change as the systems become more sophisticated, but right now they're not. We certainly need all those ecosystems and so forth. So I thought this was um, a terrific set of uh, talks that dovetail nicely one thing that is missing, if I can put somebody on the spot, is originally had Yajin um, in this session and moved up to the first session. I went back and forth, but um, she's also done a lot of thinking about benchmarks. And part of um, what we need to do to ethics, to get to ethics, I think, is actually to take a path through common sense. So you can't reason about, would it be okay if I did this or that um, to this person unless you can reason about their intuitive psychology and physical reasoning and so forth. And to get there, we need to have some reliable way of at least measuring our progress towards common sense. So, Yejin, can you talk just a little bit about how you think about that? Yeah, um, sure. I've been actually revising my thoughts a lot. So as you, uh, or at least Gary knows, I made quite a few benchmarks within a year, like eight or nine of them, depending on how you count, including uh, counterfactual reasoning, a word that popped up often in this um, uh, panel. And by the way, it's probably a bit different from the kind of a counterfactual reasoning that um, some of the panelists might have assumed in the sense that minds are really all based on language. Abductive reasoning, diffusible inference, we've been looking at all these non-monotonic reasoning challenges in AI all through done in natural language. And in doing so, I realize whenever we frame the benchmarks as multiple choice questions, what happens is that leaderboard um, achieves, the neural networks achieve human performance on leaderboards without actually solving the task. Why is it that? It's because uh, the framework of learning doesn't make any sense whatsoever in my mind. So I'm going to say something totally controversial, but I think that there's truth to it. Imagine as a human, trying to learn about deep learning and the professor doesn't teach anything. They, uh, the professor just give you lots of multiple choice questions to study. There's no lecture, no tutorial, no textbook whatsoever. You're just given a lot of exam problems and you, you try to learn deep learning for the first time in your life by reading, you know, the, solving these exam problems. Now, some deep learning people say that self-supervised learning is the way to go. So forget about multiple choice questions and supervised learning. Let's do unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning by looking at lots of a Python code or deep learning code. The thing is, well, if you already know how to read the deep learning code, the Python, that's a cheating. I'm going to give you a code, lots of a code written in Korean language a new programming language that you've never seen before. And as a human, I don't think self-supervised learning will succeed at all in learning anything. So the truth about the current deep learning paradigm, although I'm a big fan of deep learning and everything that I do, does use deep learning as a subcomponent, I think it's just wrong. And so the benchmark, I believe, will have to be set up in a more generative way, which is alluded in my talk as well. So, you know, human intelligence, you don't really believe in SAT or GRE in order to accept PhD students, nor do we decide who's going to get Turing Award based on that either. So there's something about this generative quality ability that human intelligence has, 
which if AI is going to become closer to, I think we need to really test the quality of intelligence generatively. And so right now, GPT-3, all these you know, um, failure examples with GPT-3 is uh, implicitly of that nature. G uh, Gary was showing some examples where you make GPT-3 say something, then very quickly it says all this nonsense, incoherent uh, uh, narratives that uh, we would never make. So. I uh, stepped there. All right. Um, my original plan was to have a discussion in this panel and then a larger panel, but the ethics and so forth connect to so many people in so many ways that I've just sort of taken us to panel three. Um, and another question, ways things connect, is Celeste framed things up in the beginning very much in terms of human biases, human cognitive biases. Um, and of course, we have Danny Kahneman here, who's you know, the leading expert in the world on human cognitive biases. Uh, Danny is wrinkling his brow, but um, here's, here's the question for you. There's a vast, um, but to me, unsatisfying literature about how to ameliorate human cognitive biases. What can we do about them, given that we know that they're there, um, either in terms of how we should you know, regulate our social media companies or critical thinking education or anything like this? So you've documented, and many people inspired by you have documented other biases, what do you think about interventions? Yeah, you're muted. Uh, well, the biasing, I think it's fair to say, is not a success story. Uh, the, the efforts at changing the way that people think intuitively uh, have not really been very successful. There is a big difference between cognitive biases and the kind of biases that we've talked about here, uh, the discrimination and, and attitude and motivation. I think they're really two families and the interventions that are likely to work on, oh, it, both of those are going to be very difficult, but the difficulties are going to be different. Um, we are, we are, two colleagues and I are finishing, just finished a book actually, in which we talk about not the biasing, but something that we call decision hygiene. And decision hygiene would be some prescriptive principles that you apply uh, in thinking how to think or in thinking how to make decisions uh, without knowing what are the biases that you're trying to uh, eliminate. And in that sense, it is like hygiene, that when you wash your hands, you don't know what you are preventing. And there are principles of decision hygiene that, well, um, I can't say I'm very optimistic about that because I'm rarely optimistic about things, but uh, it's a direction that one could go. I, I really like that phrase. And while we have that room, Barbara, if we can tilt the camera, wanted to ask a question before that I think is even more relevant now that we have a broader um, platform about kind of different cultures and so forth. Do you want to frame that now? Are you muted though? You're, you're muted still, Barbara. There are many things about the AI initiatives um, emulating people in some way or another that mystify me. One of them is that I tried to say is the reliance on words when so much of human interaction and understanding comes in other ways, not in words. Um, and another, I mean, babies, certainly. Another is a common sense reasoning. So, it, you know, you look at people during, um, I heard an interview with a woman the other day who you couldn't guess what political party she was in. And she said, I won't get COVID because I don't have the right vibrations. And you only get COVID if you have the right bright vibrations. Now, what do you do with that? It's a different kind of, of, of common sense reasoning. Um, we have different periods of history with different explanations, religions, different ethnic groups describe and understand things differently. 
different people come to. So I'm wondering what common sense reasoning would be, would it look like? I mean, I have a similar question about innate and, and learned is, um, what would it look like? Now, some of you who've worked on common sense reasoning may have good ideas and thoughts on that. I'm a total novice. <coughs> Anyone want to take that? I would like to respond, if that's OK, to the earlier point that uh, Dr. Kahneman made um, about discrimination being fundamentally different or being in a different family than cognitive bias. Um, I mean, and I, this is also related, related to the common sense point, but I mean, a cognitive bias is something that gives rise to discrimination. So one cognitive bias is outgroup homogeneity, right? So if I only hang out with white people my whole life, I confuse black people. I think they're the same person, right? And this is exactly the cognitive bias that then ends up with you thinking that like people who are black are less good at something because you're not you're not modeling those nuances in your bias, right? I mean, I think this also goes to the point about common sense. You know, we can only build up our common sense based on our experiences in the world. And so it might be commonsensical to us to follow some sort of uh, discriminatory path based on the biases we've picked up. Um, so I just want to make that like very clear that discrimination and biases and how those are packed into model development are very closely tied. So yeah, I just want to add to it, if okay. I can. That, uh, can, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to add that uh, some biases are launderable by AI system, by, uh, so by virtue of us being able to point out the kind of biases that we are vulnerable to, we can design algorithms that repair those biases in certain areas, not in all of them. I'll give you just a simple example. Selection bias in experiments where, where the volunteers that are recruited for a randomized experiments are taken from a different population than the population that you want to apply eventually the treatment too. Yeah. That kind of bias, we just noticed that it can be repaired with under certain circumstances by modeling the kind of uh, the biases that are being, uh, uh, being subject to. So I think it's, it's an opportunity for AI to have algorithms that are bias laundered I can add to that. Go in this. Oh, and then Robert, and then I'm going to change topics in a moment after that. So, Celeste. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so so circling back um, to to the point that that Dr. Tversky raised, uh, what do you do when somebody uh, says that they think that they can't get COVID because they don't have the right vibrations? Um, uh, that's a question that we've we've been asking uh, a lot in the lab, and we had been uh, working on. Uh, when somebody has confidence that's not justified given evidence in the world, uh, how do you shake that confidence? And we, we haven't come up with any good solutions. Nothing we've tried has worked. Uh, what you do is 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 maybe, uh, uh, it may be too late. Um, so one point that I want to raise is uh, working backwards from that point and asking how did that person get that idea? Uh, when you walk backwards, uh, what you often find is that people went to the internet, they did their research, um, uh, they uh, maybe searched for a, a search term that they thought was kind of neutral, but that was going to bring up voted results, and uh, they came up with a, a stronger, uh, uh, a more strongly held belief than they would have had uh, under other more naturalistic circumstances where you're walking around the world and it takes more time to uh, collect the information and, and make up your mind, but uh, that slowness allows you to encounter uh, different sources of information, contradictory perspectives. This is a real problem with uh, algorithmically suggested content that uh, people have pointed out, but we haven't really uh, uh, 
dug in in part because we can't because the algorithms are, are proprietary. So um, uh, asking how people got to these beliefs um, uh, is a point that I wanted to make. I want to say one other thing, which is um, uh, something else that's not obvious, but that we've been working on the working on in my lab for a while is that um, uh, it's easy to think about there being a population of other people that are less careful than you that have uh, misconceptions. Uh, when we survey people about a whole wide range of beliefs, what we find is that we all have beliefs that are not justified uh, given evidence in the world. That's just inevitable given that we have limited time and attentional resources. Uh, so, so that's all of us. It's all of us that are subject to uh, these biases that get left with the wrong idea. Um, uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not, it's not just others. Robert, and then I'm going to move to a different topic. Right. So my point is quick is that, so Dr. Pro just mentioned, um, uh, how you could model selection bias and uh, more generally, uh, we cognitive biases, some of them, not all of them, some of them are useful inductive biases for the very hard problem of induction. Um, you know, point being is that, uh, these problems that we're talking about for this, for, for the audience of uh, machine learners, out, machine learning researchers and practitioners out there, these problems that we're talking about, they're not just politics and philosophy, but they're actually very interesting technical problems uh, that are very much uh, worth diving into and, um, and chewing on. So this one, I think it's a really important point to make. I'm gonna move on to a different topic because watching the clock here. Um, it's a little bit selfish. I'm building robots, and I'm very curious what Fei Fei has to say about it, and it connects to something um, that Danny said, so um, about system one and what's in it. So one of the things that I assume is in system one is physical reasoning, not all physical reasoning. I mean, there's, you know, the physics that you might do in school, but the physical reasoning that my kids do when they decide that they can walk on a log or that that's a worthwhile experiment to do um, is really interesting and it's something that's largely eluded robots. So most of the robots that we have right now do very limited amounts of physical reasoning. So they know how to avoid objects um, with various kinds of sensors, but they can't really in general um, reason like just how to navigate an everyday room. Whereas I can look in everybody's background here, almost everybody's background and make some guesses. Like, you know, I think I see maybe a kitchen behind um, Doris and I can make some guesses about how it might navigate through there based on a two-dimensional image that I haven't even gotten multiple viewpoints on. Um, so Fei-Fei, I know you're starting to think about physical reasoning and embodiment and so forth. I'd like you to jump in. Yejin might have some things to say, whoever else wants to jump in on how we're gonna solve this question of the side of physical reasoning that maybe fits in in system one. That's unconscious and automatic um, for human beings. We do it very effectively. It also enters into language because we often reason about the physical world when we interpret language. Barbara might have something to say. Um, so I'm opening that up broadly, but starting with Fei-Fei. Yeah, thanks Gary for asking this. You know, um, for, for my early part of my career, I spent most of my time believing that seeing is understanding and it's a very passive way of looking at the world. And if you look at things like image classification, but it really, really, I had a switch of heart and dawned on me that um, embodiment and interaction is a fundamental part of uh, intelligence um, evolution and development, whether you have babies and observe the early years or, or especially the uh, pre-verbal year or months of the, the human life and also most of animal evolution. Um, so I cannot agree more that physical reasoning is part of the, 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 the larger principles of developing intelligence. And I think, um, I don't necessarily feel we have to go through the route of robot, physical robot per se, especially with the advances of simulation environments. Uh, we, we see a lot of exciting uh, uh, work emerging from you know academia to industry labs on, on uh, learning agents navigating and interacting in simulation environments and um, um, you know I don't I mean I can dive e even deeper into what we are I'll doing ask but you a specific question there I've seen some of the amazing simulation work um, from your lab uh, recently 
there's something missing, although you're probably working on it if I know you, um, which is affordances. So there's been very good stuff about kind of navigating and what you'll see in different places and you know, reconstructions of rooms and houses. Um, you can maybe uh, post a link, we'll have a place later. Really amazing stuff. Um, but as it, when it comes to embodiment and how I think about like my kids, now they're six and seven, but when they were like two and three and learning about the physical world, a lot of it was about physical affordances. So I can hold this pencil or I can hold this phone or maybe I can take off the case. I did this once before, you know, I can bend the case and isn't that interesting. Um, how close are we to being able to simulate any of that stuff, the kind of physical interactions with the world? Oh, it's definitely happening. I mean, um, you're right, we're working on this, but there are some even bigger leaders. You know, NVIDIA has this incredible physics models. There's a lot of physics en engines happening and, and interactivity with objects and environments. We've got work um, uh, from Kristen Grumman's uh, group looking at, um, you know, learning object affordances by uh, interacting. Um, so, so it's, it's one thing I really, really believe in is Gary, the, 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 the I, I talk about the dialing between explorative to exploitative um, experiences for embodied agent and whether it's animals or humans or, or intelligent agent, we go through that in and out in, in such effortless way and, and, and also sometimes task driven, sometimes it's goal driven. And I think we, we have to have that in the next uh, chapter of AI development to, to solicit these uh, learning principles um, Rich, it strikes me you might want to jump in here as well. You've, you've probably thought about these kind of things a lot. You're muted, though. How does that? Strangely, uh, uh, I, I try very hard not to think about uh, the particular uh, contents of knowledge, and and we th I like to because I'm trying to capture the the, the abstract principles. And so I don't, I try to think of the, how we think about space as just the way, as being similar to just the way we think about everything. So we just wait, well, how do we think about things? Well, we imagine a state and we imagine something we might do. And then we imagine what might result. And then we put together these beliefs about transitions into a belief about what we should do, what we should value. So, so I'm, I, I kind of resist this question I don't want to think about physical space as being a special case. Barbara, do you want to say anything there? Um, yeah, I'm muted. Yeah, I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, Very nice. I want, as usual, to open questions. And Pei Pei alluded to this uh, um, briefly. Um, and that's how much we learn from other people, from watching them, from doing, in, and from interacting with them. So, and as to the physical world being, having a different set of explanations than the, the living world, I, that may be built in, Gary, in your sense, that till infants understand trajectories of motion that are caused physically, like billiard balls bouncing against walls or sides, and self-motivated trajectories, which need to have something active creating them because they're doing things that wouldn't happen in the natural physical world. But I'm also thinking again of social interactions, of imitation. And imitation, again, in small children, isn't of the exact movements. It's often of the goals. So the, the exact movements are made differently because the infant is picking up the goal. So I, I just want to put those things out as challenges for anyone who might have thoughts on them. I think goals are incredibly important. You, one of the papers you might be alluding to is in science, um, Georgie Gergay, um, maybe five or six years ago, where there's an imitation that 14 month old is doing. And I, I won't be able to reconstruct the experiment exactly right now, but um, kids will either imitate the exact action if they feel like um, that's the appropriate thing or they'll realize that the person who was doing the experiment was doing something in some crazy way because they were encumbered. And instead of copying what that encumbered person is doing, they'll just do what that person was trying to do. Like the person's trying to 
touch something, they do it with their nose because their hands are tied. Well, the kids won't do it with their nose if their own hands aren't. Pretty amazing stuff, pretty early in life. Of course, innateness is not equal to at birth, but it's clear that in the first couple of years of life that representations of space are pretty rich, representations of goal are pretty rich. And we don't really have good systems for that yet. And that's part of, I think, the challenge confronting us. And for, for Yejin, I guess part of the question is like, how do we represent that kind of common sense knowledge about other people's goals and the objects that they might want to interact with? Do you want to add anything there? Oh, sure. And also, I would like to answer some of the earlier questions, starting perhaps uh, from Barbara's question about uh, language, because that was also discussed in the panel chat on the side, that um, often people ask me that, you know, my baby has common sense without language yet, and my dog has common sense without language yet. And it's true that octopus also has common sense without language. So the question is, um, do we want to limit that common sense AI research down to babies and animals, or do we want to uh, make a system that can understand adult common sense as well, which by the way, includes these social interactions. Um, the implications of saying one thing at a time, and then you can reason about people's theory of mind. And in doing so, language is such a convenient representation medium for us because if we uh, try not to use language, we then have to define some symbol meaning something and it just gets really messy and not very productive. So um, in relation to that, another um, frequently asked the question is whether we have to have embodiment. And I think we do, but it alone is not going to be uh, uh, achieving AGI in the following sense. Um, although robots and simulation environments are advancing a lot, I really don't think that we will anytime build a robot that can crunch into an apple to feel that juicy, crunchy feel that humans feel. So imagine that you build a simulation environment in which some engineers write a reward function that gives you some reward. How is that any better than compared to the language description of what humans feel when we bite into an apple? So to me, I mean, two things are both the symbolic, um, it's sort of like not real experience, but they are both useful in some ways, but the simulation environment the fundamental limitation, although I work on it too, is that we're sort of a pushing the hard challenge of building the model of the world down to some software engineers building the simulation environment. I, I think there's going to be fundamental limit. I think, um, uh, th there were some articles written by your friend at New York. Hey, Ernie Davis. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I believe he wrote an article about that. Um, so there's that. But however, I think what uh, Fei Fei said about interaction, now this is really interesting because even as a human, I don't think babies will really acquire language just by reading lots of raw text. Uh, we have to interact with the people. And I think there's a lot of development in psychology study as well about how babies acquire words and concepts through interactions, through language, but through interactions. So even for language only study, I do think that the missing interaction part is one of the major curious challenge that AI people need to think more of. All right, another change of topic. Um, I'm gonna start maybe with Ken. Um, and I bet Rich will have some things to say here, maybe other folks. Um, <laughs> the topic is curiosity. So you didn't, I don't, well, I guess you did use the word in the talk. And I've also heard you um, talk a bunch of times about novelty. And one of the things that really struck me watching my kids grow up, now they're six and seven, now that they're old, no, it hasn't really changed actually. Um, watching my kids grow up is how much they set their own goals. So I gave an example before of walking on a log in order to see if they could balance on it. So it seems to me that a huge part of what we have a gift for as humans, um, at least early in life until we become cynical and jaded, is setting ourselves an agenda that in some way advances our cognitive capabilities. This seems to be the, the genius of humans and, and perhaps some other animals as well. This um, is not human restricted, yeah. It's not human restricted. I mean, humans are really good at it. But many mammals, I mean, look at a young chimp, look at a young dog, look at the young cat, They're incredible curious, and they, want, they have this drive to explore the world, right? Totally agree. So Ken, are there any things out there that can help us to understand how we can build that into our systems? And other people can jump in, but I'll start with you. 
Yeah, it's um, this is a big a big puzzle um, because. Well, I mean, I think it's clear that curiosity is 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 fundamental um, to to early development and learning and 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 becoming intelligent as a human is. Um, it's not clear how to actually formalize or motivate curious behavior um, because um, it's not really clear how to formalize what's interesting. And so I don't always think of it in terms of like an objective, like, okay, now the kid has a new objective, jump on a log. And now the kid has an objective, like go play with that doorknob or something like that. As so much as the kid has some notion that certain things are interesting. Um, and it's like a very perceptive notion um, somehow. And we all have this, um, but it's different in all of us too. We're not all, we don't all agree on what's interesting. Um, and so if we want to have curious systems at all the different range of human intelligence from like a baby up to an adult, uh, like a mature expert in some field, we have to grapple with like this very subjective notion of what is interesting. Um, and that means that we have to grapple with subjectivity, um, which we don't like as scientists, like with benchmarks and stuff. We like being very objective about where we're trying to go. Um, and so to, to deal with subjectivity, it means that um, at the ground below a, a lot of our assumptions, there's gonna be something that, that, that can't be motivated objectively, like something that is ultimately just something that we believe. Um, and we have to somehow figure out how to get the AI to align with that. Because if we just say, go off and do things that are novel in some completely undefined way, a generic way, then um, it'll go deviate off into a space that we don't find interesting. I so see. how do we align that notion with the things that we actually find interesting so that it can sort of plunder the space that we want to exist within? I, I see Celeste raising her hand and I think Rich was maybe also raising her hand. Go ahead, Celeste well, first. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in here. That There's um, cool work uh, like from uh, Pierre-Yves Oudier's lab at, at Enria um, looking at this uh, we've done work with baby humans and also uh, some, some, some non-human primates. Uh, you could have uh, a high degree of variation in terms of the targets of people's curiosity without actually having any differences in terms of what people are applying. Uh, because we know that people tend to want to, uh, just like uh, Dr. Dr. Kahneman pointed out, um, uh, seek out stuff that's a little bit surprising given what they already know. Uh, everybody walks a different road in life. Everybody encounters different stuff. Uh, what you would expect would happen if everybody was operating with a heuristic that's like, seek out stuff that's a little bit different from what I currently understand uh, is that that natural variation that occurs in terms of what you're early exposed to and what you learn uh, kind of builds. So um, you could have people having exactly the same uh, rule, which is seek out stuff that's a little bit surprising given what I currently understand. Uh, and given that people will encounter different things and thus learn different things, uh, you'd have different areas of interest across the population. Um, so I think that that could be applied to machines and has been applied um, with a lot of success um, uh, to machines by, by people like Pierre Eve. Rich? I have a different uh, notion, but uh, as an incomplete theory of curiosity. And this is, is based on the idea that people and some animals are striving to get into, to get into, to acquire a system that makes them feel in control. And a, in a system like that is identical to the one I mentioned that, um, that uh, uh, deserves the title Deep Understanding. Okay? The system that uh, is able to cover all three levels of the hierarchy. Okay? And that has a certain template. So what drives people's curiosity is having holes in those systems. That, oh, I'm sorry. The template is the same, but it may have holes here and there. So as long as if you have a certain holes in a certain granularity, right, you feel irritated or discomfort, and that drives the curiosity. When you feel those holes, you feel in control, and your curiosity is satisfied. Rich, That's my uh, incomplete theory. That's I'm gonna connect this to something um, else. Go ahead, Rich. It's very interesting, uh, Yuda. Um, so in reinforcement learning, 
curiosity exploration plays in a number of different roles. I mean, I guess it plays many roles throughout theories of the mind generally. Um, but in, in reinforcement learning, it, it has a really low level role, like just to explore in order to drive the agent to try different things. You have to try different things to find out which one is better and how does, so you need something that, that forces variety. But in recent years, uh, people have begun to look and, and I've begun to look at a more, um, a larger role for uh, which we, I think what we're referring to now, I, I, I use, I like to, to use the word play. We play we, means we set goals for ourselves that are not necessarily instrumental, but you know, we're kind of learning and maybe it'll be useful later. So yeah, we pick a log, can I walk on this log? Uh, we pick some task and we just say, hey, can I do that? Let's figure out what I'm, what I'm able to do, what I'm capable, what affordances are part here in the world. So for me, uh, this is actually one of the four big things that I think people do along with like perception and planning and uh, building models of the world. The uh, fourth one is play. So what does play mean? Play means you, you've set yourself a task and then you're learning the skill to achieve it. And then you'll have that skill available so you can um, maybe, maybe use it later to do various things to get reward. Play is a big thing. So I'm gonna to toss out a term that I see scrolling by here in the chat window for panelists um, from Francesca, which is metacognition. And I'll make it kind of a jump ball if anybody wants to talk about it, but I'll just say, I think there's some connection here that at least what I saw in my kids, it was kind of a metacognition. What can I do? What would I like to do? How can I make myself uh, you know, have more skills? So anybody wanna talk about metacognition and you know, how they think about it, how we might implement it? Do they think it's important here? Yeah, let, let me start, Gary. So, yeah, so in uh, in trying to understand how to model this, uh, you know, thinking fast and slow in a machine, we we it seems to us that there must be some place either within system one or within the system two capabilities or somewhere else in between the two where there is this. Uh, introspection and metacognition. So where the, the machine, like just like the human being, must be able to reason about its own capabilities, about how different it is, what the task that is presented compared to what he knows already, and to draw some conclusions and to say, okay, then I would like to more, you know, respond in this way or in this other way, or I would like to to define a new procedure to respond to this uh, stimulus from outside. So to me, that is essential. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not clear to me, you know, how, how to implement it, but definitely I think it's, it's either a module or it's a distributed capability that needs to be there and can be really helpful also in terms of curiosity and uh, um, playing uh, as Rich was saying. Anyone else on that? Or else I have an audience question. Go ahead, Lewis. Yes, um, from our perspective, of course, we want uh, creativity, attention. Uh, we want to do that in a constructive way in AI. But eventually, what we want to do at the end of the day is to have to get the reasoning sound in terms of combining this perspective of a parallel perception of the world in terms of system one and system two, because they are integrated. I don't, I don't see them as separate entities. I think that uh, the learning component of uh, truly AI, uh, I mean, truly sound AI systems, they have to see them in, uh, in a convergent way, in a way that you conciliate what you are being learning within your experience in the environment. It could be like a reinforcement learning or deep learning, however, uh, eventually, the reasoning process has to be built in a sound way. All right, I'm going to ask one, or possibly if we have time, two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and I'm going to, I want everybody to answer this next one if they're brave enough. Um, and I'll do it in the order that we started. So I'll start with Faith A, um, move to Lewis, and so forth, um, so that we can get everybody in. I also thought about alphabetical, but. Um, so Fei Fei, you go first. And the question, and it came from the audience, and it's a good one, is where do you want AI to go? What, what would make you happy? 
know, we, we talked a lot today about, you know, how to make AI better in different ways, but what is the objective here? The objective function for those of us who are building AI um, or trying to inform it from uh, other fields? You know, what, what would count as success? Where do you want to take it to? Okay, so as a scientist, I want to push the scientific knowledge and principles of AI further and further. And the first thing is start with uh, some really um, fundamental laws and principles of AI. I keep saying that I still feel our AI era is pre-Newtonian physics, that we are still studying phenomenology and uh, engineering, but there is going to be a moment or, or a set of moments where we're starting to understand the, the principles of intelligence. And that is the scientists in me wearing the hat of a, a citizen, I guess, and uh, directing Stanford's Human Center AI Institute. I want this to be a technology that can, in an idealistic way, really better human conditions, right? It's so profound. Um, it's so horizontal. It's so, um, it has so much human and uh, societal impact. Um, it, it, it can be very, very bad and can be very, very good. So there, I, I would like to see a, a framework of this technology being developed and deployed in the most uh, uh, benevolent way. Awesome. Louis, you want to take a stab? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all for organizing. This was wonderful. Um, I like one of the sayings of Michael Rabin from uh, Harvard and Hebrew University. He said that it's great that uh, computer science has not been around for 2,000 years, and we are at a stage where very, very important results occur in front of our eyes. And I also like a saying by uh, Alan Turing in his mind paper, where he said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. And as Fei-Fei said, as scientists, I want AI to advance, but since AI is having an impact as big as physics had in the 20th century, engineering had in the 20th century, all the ethical issues, all the biases and all the social implications that Margaret and others and here and Francesca have been studying, they are key uh, as responsibility of our, ourselves as scientists. And in terms of uh, technical, technically speaking, what we are trying to do is to conciliate traditions of AI so that we cannot see, and as you said, Gary, before you've been saying since the late 90s, we have to converge, we have to look for convergence. You cited Ian Lecon, you cited other prominent scientists today. We need a way of seeing that several techniques can contribute to this endeavor of making AI fairer, AI uh, less biased, and AI to make something very positive for us as humanity. We need, uh, as scientists, to see our fields in a very uh, human, humanistic way so that not only the technical stuff advances, but we also have to be guided by serious and by effective ethical principles laws and norms, as Ryan said. It's hard to, to, do, to do that at the moment. We are at the beginning of uh, an AI Cambrian explosion, as several people mentioned here, but we need to be very aware of the social, ethical, and global implications that AI has these days. We have to be concerned about the North-South the north -south divide, about the different cultures in order to regulate it properly. We cannot see it only from a single cultural perspective. So that's what I want to see uh, AI researchers doing to be, they have to be concerned about the technical results, the outstanding results AI has been showing, but also we have to be, to care about other people, about other peoples, other countries, and overall, and overall uh, for the global health of the planet. Thank you very much. And uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, Gary and Vincent for the, brilliant debate you brought that, today and for the top scientists. That was a beautiful combination of your secretary of state and your scientist. So that was lovely. Rich? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence, it sounds like something very technical. Um, but I agree with Luis that 
or as he suggested, that it, it really is maybe the most humanistic of all endeavors. It's people trying to figure out how, how they themselves work, uh, trying to make themselves better, trying to understand intelligence, trying to, trying to maybe make uh, new intelligences. So I look forward uh, to us, our greater understanding and uh, a world populated with different kinds of intelligences and augmented people and new people and um, it's understanding and just novelty in, in, in varieties of intelligence. Lovely. I think Judea is gone. I don't oh, I'm here. I'm here. You're here. Okay. Some reason I can't see you. On the practical side, all I want is to have an intelligent and very friendly and super competent apprentice. I have only so many shows in my day that if I had an intelligent apprentice, I'll be ha very happy. On the scientific side, I would like to understand myself, how I think, how I uh, am being aroused emotionally, concerned emotionally. And there are some difficult <clears throat> scientific questions about myself, about our system of thinking that I don't have yet a solution for. And I know that emulating myself will be understanding myself. For instance, consciousness, and for instance, free will. If I can build a robot that has the kind of free will that I have, I can, I'll take it as the greatest scientific achievement of the 21st century, and I make a prediction, we are going to have it. All right. Uh, next up is Robert. Yeah, so much of the focus about the... the uh, the public debate about artificial intelligence is focused on it's automating a way of humans from things that humans do. And that's obviously a very important component and, and worth debate. Um, I think in some of the previous speakers have, uh, have mentioned, it's, it's interesting to think about how this could actually augment human intelligence um, and, and how it could for example, enhance meaningful human experiences. So with all the discussion about GPT-3, I've seen a couple of posts where people have written editorials or blog posts uh, or even poetry using language, this, these large language models. And I'm thinking to myself like, ill, why would you want to do this? It's just remixing whatever elements of poetry or, or you know, hacky blog posts you found in the corpus. And why not, you know, wouldn't it be better to build something that actually helped poets uh, create novel poetry? And, uh, and so rather than, you know, remixing is great. I mean, I like pop music, for example, but I mean, we'd also like to hear some novel, um, you know, truly creative new endeavors. And, and so I'm hoping that what AI does is, you know, when Photoshop came out, you know, the first people to use Photoshop were the engineers who built it and they'd make, you know, those those, you know, Kind of matrixy, you know, lawnmower man uh, images of of um, you know virtual reality people. But then now nowadays, if you are a, a designer, no designer worth their salt doesn't know how to use Photoshop. I'm ho I'm hoping that um, AI will do for meaningful human experience what Photoshop has done for designers. Awesome, um, Ken. Yeah, so, I mean, first, I think it's it's just interesting how difficult it is to articulate what we're trying to accomplish. You know, this is just such a great endeavor. Um, but um, I think for me, it's a little bit along the lines of what Robert just said, um, where um, I think that we have to be doing this for ourselves. So we definitely don't want to get rid of ourselves. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, I guess it means that um, there are things that we have the capacity to do as individuals and together that um, that we we need help to do, but we can't do without some help. Um, and so, in some way, like for example, I I know great art when I see it, but I can't produce great art or I know great music when I hear it. Um, and somehow, these kind of latent capabilities that we have 
maybe could be made more explicit if we had the right kind of assistance. Um, and so in some way, I think that what AI can do and would be really exciting if it would do is just amplify us in our capabilities um, and give us the ability to express ourselves, um, which I think is like deeply what we just really want to do anyway. Fantastic, Adrian. Sure. So, yeah, I think um, personally, I have um, two um, uh, things that I'm really excited about AI, the potential of a future AI. So partly, it's just really fun. Um, uh, we've been talking about curiosity earlier. And I think what's really fun right now is this curiosity about how to break things and challenge existing assumptions we have about the learning paradigms so that finally we might have some crack, real crack at the human intelligence um, and be able to create things that do wonderful things, amazing things that we could never create before. So there's that sort of intellectual gratification and I would like to, um, uh, I, I would like to stay uh, uh, optimistic that we can go very far um, in the next few decades. And then I have this other uh, part of me. Uh, so equity and um, uh, diversity is really deep in my heart. And I'm really amazed by this opportunity that I have both in education as well as research to make the world better in that uh, regard. Uh, improving um, uh, biases that people have. And I think fundamentally human biases, they don't know if they have a biases, otherwise it's not unconscious biases. And we might really be able to help them uh, to um, you know, wake up by creating AI that can help them understand what sort of biases they have. But we have a lot more to go. So I'm excited to um, see what happens next year. Very good, Barbara. So I see lots of AIs here, um, AIs that are trying to emulate people. And there I worry a little bit of, are you trying to emulate the mistakes we make, um, our biases, our misinterpretations, or are you trying to perfect us? Um, so that's one set of AIs. I see other AIs that, that are that seem to be acting as tools for us and I, I and then worrying about implicit bias in those tools and worrying about how humans perform the same functions in a way to make humans even better at those functions. So the creativity, the music, the poetry, all of that is helpful. From my own point of view, what I, I study human behavior and I'm always interested in what the AI community can create and what it's interested in because those issues are, have always been eye-opening to me and make me think of different ways that I should study human behavior. Awesome, Danny? Well, uh, I first became interested in the new AI, I think, through Demis Asabis. And that was a few years ago. And I'm really struck, in a sense, by how much more modest you seem to be now than he was like six or seven years ago, when he had a very simple slogan, solve intelligence and then solve everything else. Uh, and that's the motto, I think, of DeepMind uh, to this day. That's uh, that's a wonderful hope. It seems to be very distant. It seems to have become actually more distant, I think, in the last few years. Another observation that I have to make is, and that's about the idea of an, of an apprentice, of, and actually this idea comes up all over the place, that humans should remain somehow in control. Here, I think there is real room for pessimism because what we find is that once uh, AI or any system of rules competes with human judgment, uh, eventually they will beat human judgment. And the idea that, that they actually still need a human, I think probably not. So 
what we are going to see that when there is a domain that AI masters, then I think humans will have very little to add in that domain and that could have a very, very complicated and I think probably painful consequences. Next we have Doris. Yeah, so my goal is to understand the brain and I think the brain is complicated, but it's not hopelessly complicated. And I want neuroscience and AI to work together to develop the simplest, most powerful and beautiful explanation of how the brain works. Fantastic, Adam. Well, Gary, I think many reasons. So one, I think it's fundamental to basic science, not just neuroscience and the brain and how, does, how, how do babies work? Like you were asking how your kids work. Gary, but but also, you know, how how does evolution work? How does culture work? If we can crack this open-ended complexity generation thing that Ken Stanley was talking about, that will be fundamental for the natural sciences as well. Um, second, uh, I hope it will amplify human creativity. So both the, the the most advanced scientists will be able to do more than they could on their own, but also, you know, some random kid could design a, a space station. Um, then I also think that it may lead to huge societal changes. Maybe it'll get us something like a universal basic income, you know, really change society. Right? And then finally, maybe it'll be our, our descendants in the universe in thousands of years um, going out into space. So there's a lot of reasons to work with AI. Please stop. You're muted, Christoph. As a scientist, I look forward to working with AI to help us understand the brain because there is a continuous influx of AI and AI-powered AI machine learning to help us understand these fantastic uh, data sets. But as a citizen, I guess as Seife emphasized, I also feel that uh, much of AI is, is naive as concerned the medium or long-term future and self-serving AI has accelerated. In fact, I think tech is part of the reason for the growing inequality and I don't see that lessening anytime uh, in the next years. The growing distrust in our societies, not only in US but worldwide, the tribalism, the strife, the social media. And then I'm again, I was, su I was surprised today, uh, Gary, quite frankly, when we talk about ethics, what comes to mind very often, so I hang out because of the family I'm born into with uh, people who work at, at state departments, who deal with international laws, military laws, et cetera. And there's a, there's, a, there's a big concern here with militarization of AI, right? Danny just mentioned uh, human decision-making, humans in the loop, right? People are trying to negotiate uh, treaties, limiting, should we limit, should there always be a human in the loop when we, when we build dangerous, um, machines, you know, killer robot, as well as is happening, as we all know in the, uh, in the defense world and, and as will uh, happen. So what about the growing threats uh, of militarization of AI, which is ongoing and what should we, uh, should we do anything about it or pessimistic, can we do anything about it? Or is that just, uh, is that uh, um, genie out of the box? I'm glad you raised that, we, we hadn't touched on it yet. Celeste. Um, uh, I don't think I have anything to add. <laughs> uh, that's fine. I, I think we did great good coverage. Uh, Margaret, if you like, and then Francesca and Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Um, so like similar to Celeste, I suppose we're near the end. So like want to sort of ditto, I guess, a lot of what other people have said. But so I'll sort of come at this from a cynical angle to say that like, my goal, and I think a lot of people's goals in developing AI, is that they find it interesting and fun. And I think as academics, we are very good at post hoc uh, rationalization and justification of the work we do as being noble and great and having these like large spans. Um, but uh, fundamentally, part of what we're doing is just sort of entertaining ourselves. And I think it's really important to be clear on that because that's actually driving the decisions we make. 
um, you know, maybe informed also by these longer term goals. But there's this actually just a sort of the self serving kind of pull that's really creating a lot of this. Um, so I think that's just worth flagging. I think everyone knows that. But for the public generally, um, you know, it isn't all just noble goals. It's like nerds nerding out. Right. Um, but the other thing that I really am hoping AI can be used for is to disrupt human biases. So, for example, when you write a performance review, it's more common to talk about how women have communication difficulties and use language around communication difficulties. If we had AI capable of understanding the kinds of language used in different kinds of performance reviews, then it could actually interrupt and inject in a discriminatory or in an unequal process by noticing that unequal process. Um, so I would love to see AI sort of turned on its head in order to handle really problematic human biases. Francesca. Yeah, I mean, I really have to follow up on what my, what was just said, because I mean, okay, in the practical terms, uh, one could say, oh yeah, okay, AI can help us uh, amplify our capabilities, solve difficult problems, some of those that we created ourselves, but now we don't know how to solve, so maybe it can help us uh, uh, solve difficult problems in various domains. Uh, and uh, it can help us, of course, understand ourselves, you know, understand our intelligence. But I think that what was just said is very important because, for example, from my personal point of view, I never thought so much about my values, what are values that are important to me see, before you know, working on AI ethics, before understanding what values we want to inject into these AI systems, what the AI system should be used for and what should not be used for, you know, um, weapons, uh, uh, other possible applications, you know. So, so to me, of course, this is a personal thing, but it's, I don't think it's just a personal reflection on my own values. I think it's something that uh, the whole society and everybody has the opportunity to do. Uh, because a lot of media is about that, those issues around AI. So it's a way to reflect on our own values. So improve the understanding of ourselves, but also our awareness of our own limitations, bias, as we just said, and improve, be more aware and more clear about what are the values. And if we can do that through evaluation of AI and what we inject into AI, then of course, everything will come through like new rules, new regulations, new everything that where our societies are built and what is done within societies in all the different uh, endeavors because of our better understanding of what and clarity about our own values. So that would be, you know, the ultimate goal in my view. I'm going to let Celeste reclaim her time. I, um, I'm going to, I, I, I uh, was inspired by, by Margaret and Francesca and what they said, and, and this isn't exactly the, the, the answer to the question uh, in which I agree with, with what everybody said, but um, uh, I think that what I want for, from AI, it's more like what I want from humans, which is a different understanding about what AI is uh, and what it's capable of. Uh, I wanted to bring up the, the Stanford case of uh, uh, them deciding who gets the vaccines. There were only being seven uh, frontline workers that were, that were on the list. And when people got upset uh, reasonably um, uh, and questioned uh, the decision-making process, they, they pointed to an algorithm and said like, oh, the algorithm did that. <laughs> um, uh, people uh, are behind algorithms. They may make decisions that have unintended consequences. But at the end of the day, what we really need, I think, is a shift from thinking of AI as something separate that you can point to and blame um, uh, uh, that is, is, is people can think of as, as more objective in a sense um, to uh, holding people accountable for the AI they develop and the decisions that they make that go into it, uh, even if there are unintended consequences. Ryan? Yeah, um, I want the costs and the benefits of AI to be evenly distributed across society, both in the United States and globally. And I want the public to trust that that's what's being done. And I think that's impossible without changes to law. <laughs> Just impossible. Thank you very much. So um, we're a little bit over time. And I'm going to wrap up and then Vince will say a few things and I will try to keep my remarks brief given the late hour. Um, the first thing I want to say is I had very high expectations knowing all of you. Um, and you know, I was thrilled to gather you here all in one day and my expectations were exceeded. I learned a lot. 
Um, I loved all of your talks. And I especially love this last question, getting so many different perspectives about why we're even doing this in the first place uh, and what we need to do. Um, I am reminded of the old African proverb that I'm sure you all know, which is it takes a village to raise a child. Clearly it will take a village um, as we've seen today to raise an AI that is ethical, robust and trustworthy. Um, and it was great to have a, you know, some piece of that village here today. So I wanna thank our amazing panelists. Um, this has every bit of, been every bit as fun as I imagined it would be. I look forward to seeing you all again in person before long. I hope we'll have many more discussions in the years to come. So thank you very much panelists. Give yourself a round of applause if you can. Um, and then I want to also thank Vince who is um, not actually, oh, there he is visible in the top corner. Um, he's donated all of his time to set all of this up. He's done all of the logistics. He's helped me put together all of the panels, done all of the publicity. Didn't receive a nickel for any of this. He just did it as the kindness of his heart, um, as a gift to the community. And we owe Vince a big hand. So thank you for that, Vince. Um, I want to thank the audience. We have a huge audience. I don't know how big it is, but I think it might be in the tens of thousands or something like that. Um, I hope you learned something valuable and that I hope will inspire a generation of students to confront many of the challenges that we've raised today, and maybe get some uh, new ideas into the mix. And now it's over to you, Vince, for a closing and a special announcement. Thank you so much, Gary. Ladies and gentlemen, we just had a hugely impactful and great AI debate too. My most sincere thanks to our speakers, Ryan Callow, Yejen Schwa, Daniel Kahneman, Celeste Kidd, Christophe Karsh, Louis Lamb, Fifi Lee, Adam Marblestone, Margaret Mitchell, Robert Ness, Judy Pearl, Francesca Rossi, Ken Stanley, Rich Satan, Doris Tsao, and Barbara Tversky. And a very special thanks to our moderator and co-organizer, Gary Marcus. The conversation will continue on social media with the hashtag AIDebate2. I believe there's one more announcement. And here yes, it is. Yes. Now it's time for the unveiling of the next Montreal AI debate, AI debate three. We'll do the unveiling live. So many things to control. So same time next year, but in Montreal. Yes. So we will do the unveiling right now live on the screen. So AI debate three, you have the address. We'll publish the event. It will be live now. You mean we actually get to meet physically face to face? That is our fondest hope. Wow, that's, that's great. That, that is our hope. That would be great. <laughs> so that is our hope that AI Debate 3 will be held physically in Montreal with the greatest mind in the world. I thank everyone at home for joining us. And that concludes the AI debate, too. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, Gary. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much.